Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you very much again for everybody to be available today to join uh, today's webinar. Um, we would like to thank uh, our partners today, which are the Slovenian Chinese Business Council and Extenda uh, for their contribution to today's session. And uh, I would like to leave the floor right now to uh, Ziga, who is the president of the Slovenian Chinese Business Council. Ziga, the floor is yours. Laura, thank you so much. Greetings to all participants. Um, we are very happy that we have started um, doing the cooperation with EU SME Center. Um, I'm sure that this is something uh, unique, uh, combining not only Europe, but on the other hand, also um, that we combine uh, um, the China and Europe. So I'm strongly believing that this is a great opportunity for everyone because the startup is an important area where the China and Europe can cooperate. Um, we are putting Slovenia and Chinese uh, uh, Business Council uh, to the Chamber of Commerce, which brings us, you know, to the field where startup is also cooperating really well with the industry. And I'm sure that this uh, workshop today will bring many great insights for uh, different participants. Um, this is not the only activity, so I'm always welcoming uh, different uh, uh, um, potential members to join. And, you know, saying about Slovenia and China, I'm always using the story that if you look at the map of uh, uh, both countries, you see a big rooster and small Slovenia, which is a chicken. So I'm always saying that China and Slovenia are national partners. And, you know, I'm really happy that many Slovenian startups and people who are involved in cooperating uh, with startup and China uh, got involved today. I'm wishing all of you a great uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and I'm sure that this is just the beginning of a great cooperation with all partners uh, who are involved today. And I would just like to say in the name of Slovenian Chinese Business Club, um, a big thank you for everyone involved. Thank you very much, Ziga. Uh, the USME Center is also thrilled to have the Slovenian Chinese Business Council as, as partner. Uh, and now I would like to leave the floor to Mr. Manuel Leon, who is the director of the Shanghai office of Extenda, which is uh, the trade and investment agency of Andalusia region in Spain. Manuel, the floor is yours. Good morning, Laura, Siga, Jelte, Alvaro, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, sorry for my uh, video freezing, perhaps because of some software incompatibility this morning. I would like to start by thanking the US SME Center and the Slovenian Chinese Business Forum for their cooperation in organizing this webinar today. As uh, Laura said, I represent Extend I China, which is the trade and investment promotion agency of Andalusia region from Spain. In the last 20 years, we have been present in China. Uh, Andalusia has become the second largest exporter region from Spain into China, which already represents about uh, 1.2 thousand million euros uh, of exports to China. And we are companies mainly in the business such as minerals, food and beverages, education, and so on. In the last decade, we have experienced the emergence of uh, the technological-based uh, startup entrepreneurs in our region mainly in mobility and open software industries and the establishment of several accelerators and public programs such as Andalusia Open Future or Programa Minerva. And also our regional government has put in place a set of initiatives such as a startup Andalusia Roadshow Competition or even venture capital funds to further incentivize the cons consolidation of these uh, projects. Uh, our startups are still mainly in the seed and growth stage. And although so far we have not received much demand of assistance from them to enter the Chinese market or to find Chinese investment. We consider that this is a very good opportunity, not only for our entrepreneurs to gain knowledge for market access, but also for our institutions and policymakers to benchmark the innovation ecosystem in China, which I believe uh, is one of the most successful globally nowadays. So we are excited to listen to the experts and with the experience on the ground, such as Jelte and Alvaro, 
And we hope this uh, to be an initial step for our entrepreneurs in China. So nothing else from my side. Thank you very much. And we are all ears. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, before I leave the floor to Alvaro and Yelte, who are our uh, key speakers today, I would like to spend a few minutes uh, presenting the USME Center for those who haven't heard about us before. For those who already know about us, uh, please bear with me. I will uh, shut up very, very fast and I will leave it to, to the speakers today. About the ESME Center, we are a new founded initiative that started in 2010 uh, with the purpose of helping European SMEs uh, access the, the Chinese market. Um, we are uh, five implementing partners behind this initiative. Uh, you can actually see the names and our logos uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, we are four chambers of commerce and one uh, business council. Uh, all of them are based in China except Euro Chambre, which is the um, a partner who is implementing all the activities in Europe. Um, we have an office in Beijing uh, where actually most of our colleagues are, except myself that I'm in Europe uh, working and collaborating with partners such as Stenda or the Slovenian Chinese Business Forum. Uh, in terms of services, we have four blocks of services that you can see in the screen right now. Very briefly, the first one is the Knowledge Center. This is an online library um, where you can find market reports, guidelines, case studies, and business articles on different uh, China-related topics. Some of them are very uh, transversal, uh, for instance, cross-border e-commerce or, or ways to enter the Chinese market. And some others are really uh, sector-specific, for instance, the green tech, um, food and beverage, or, or healthcare. Uh, I forgot to mention that all of the services we are, offer, uh, we are offering are free of charge for uh, European SMEs and business support organizations. Uh, you only need to be registered uh, for statistical purposes. We want to know who is behind uh, those downloads or the usage of the website in order to create additional content of your interest and use. The second block includes two services. The first one is advice, uh, is, is the self-diagnosis tool. Uh, this is an online quiz. Uh, in fact, there are five online quizzes, a general one and four specific ones that allows you to, to understand your level of readiness towards the market. There is a learning process. Uh, first, along the way, when you are actually answering the questions of the quiz, you can really understand uh, if you are doing it right or you are missing some steps. And at the end, when you finish on you complete the, the tool uh, where actually there is um, there are some recommendations and suggestions on where or how to improve uh, the existing knowledge. Uh, the second service within the advice center is Ask the Expert. This is a one-to-one -one confidential and complimentary consultation uh, on China-related topics. Here you can ask anything about business development, HR, uh, China corporate law, whatever you want. Um, our experts usually reply to your questions within two or three working days. Again, this is all complimentary. The third block is the training center. Uh, here we try to plug the knowledge and skill gaps of the SMEs that are entering China. And today is a very good example of what we are doing here in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID, we have shifted all the activities to the online format, but there is an advantage. And is that uh, today we can have experts that are uh, based in Beijing, uh, whilst normally it would be very difficult to bring them um, to a face-to-face -face, uh, event that we used to organize. In any case, once we go back uh, to, to the normality, uh, once we are over with the COVID, we will start organizing uh, presentations events as well and we welcome you all to participate. Uh, last but not least, we also have an advocacy platform. Here we have two main goals. One is to uh, provide up-to-date information on the regulatory and economic um, environment in China so that SMEs are fully aware of the restrictions or the regulation and they can adjust accordingly. But we also here, we try to give voice to the concerns and the request of the European SMEs that operate in China or what to operate. If you want additional information, you can access our website and contact our advocacy team. Now, a little bit of what's on the pipeline uh, in the coming days. Uh, well, uh, the third event is, is what is happening today, but we are organizing a B2B matchmaking event on September 24 related to the uh, gaming and e-sport industry uh, with some uh, side activities and webinars. Uh, we are also organizing uh, 
trading on the organic and food beverage sector in China on September 30th, um, a conference on best practice of European SMEs exporting to China on October 14th. And here we will not have experts telling you how to do this or how to import that in China. We will have real companies, real SMEs who have been dealing uh, with the Chinese crisis and they are going to share uh, how they manage to overcome it and in some cases how to actually um, be successful and create some uh, side businesses that help them to, to continue operating and even increase their, their um, revenue. And last but not least, I also would like to invite everybody to our flagship event, the Understanding China Training Program. This is a two half day conference which will take place between the 21st and the 27th of, uh, 22nd of October. Uh, we will be covering issues such as the impact of COVID-19 on mobility, um, how the consumers' trends have changed and shifted in the past few years. But we will also be talking about digitalization, supply chain, and other related topics. Um, the registration is already opened. We invite you to look into our website and register as soon as possible. And before we get into the, um, the experts, just a technical reminder. Uh, we would like to encourage everybody to submit questions. We want this to make this very dynamic and uh, take advantage of the knowledge of Yelte and Alvaro to clarify any questions you might have. This is a great platform and a great opportunity to exchange thoughts. But please use the Q&A button so that we can actually coordinate and organize the Q&A session that will take place at the end of the of the conference. Um, for any other related matter, or to greet people or just to comment on something, you can use the chat and we will just keep an eye on it. A little bit about our experts today, Yelte and Alvaro. Yelte is the co-founder and CEO at Founders Lay. He's going to share additional information of what he's doing. He's a startup uh, expert and he does a lot of mentoring and advising in this direction. And here you can find his contact details. Also about Alvaro. Alvaro is an entrepreneur himself. He actually has his own uh, startup called Akadu. Uh, you are going to learn a little bit more about Akadu uh, during this presentation. And if you look into um, Alvaro's t-shirt, you, you will find also his, his logo. Uh, and here you have also his email address and the website. <laughs> and now, without further ado, I leave the floor to today's speaker. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that Yelta can move on. Um, please, the floor is yours, guys. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you so much for having us. Uh, Alvaro, also, you want to say a short hi to, to the audience? Yeah, thank you, USME Center and the other organizations for organizing and making this possible. I hope that is something we all can learn here today. Yeah, um, so how we're going to structure today is, um, while the slide is loading, is we will have uh, blocks of content that dive into uh, the startup realm of China and how you can enter it. And the other part is a bit about uh, if you're not a startup, you're, you're a mid-sized or larger company and you want to enter the market, there's also some co uh, content about this. But we also have an exchange. So Alvaro, uh, the founder uh, and CEO of Akadu, will always be the devil's advocate. He will sometimes come in and say something like, Yelta, what you said is wrong, or this one you forgot to mention, something like this. Because Alvaro and I, we know each other now for a couple of years, and uh, we are both entrepreneurs. I just joined actually as an entrepreneur a bit later myself. He has uh, been doing this for, for a while longer and has been more successful than I have been. Um, so we are we exchanging a bit the content, and at, at the end of every session, we will have a short discourse. And please write your questions in the Q and A that we can stop at any time and, and dive into what you uh, what you have to ask. Right. Um, we will have also a case study about Akadu and Alvaro uh, at the end, where we go deeper into why he actually started his own business, um, what went well, what didn't. Maybe we'll share a few things on the way. Um, anything else you want to share, Avo? All good. All good. Cool. Um, so what I usually like to do, um, also when I join webinars myself, is knowing like why are the, these people talking here? Of course, you trust the organizations that they pick the right people, but I wanted to share a bit uh, why I am here today 
um, and also what kind of questions you can ask me. So um, I have been involved in the last five years heavily in the startup ecosystem in China and also in APEC. Uh, what you currently see here is on the left, uh, building blocks of a startup ecosystem. I have a slide that goes way more deeper into this. Uh, what is needed to actually uh, create a startup ecosystem and what I have covered with my roles in the past in that regard. So I'm a founder myself of Founders Lair. Um, I'm doing this for one and a half years now and uh, since June full time. I've been working as a first foreign uh, employee at a state-owned enterprise at Jungwon Sun Chuang Edadie, which is like the, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, a landmark for entrepreneurship and innovation in Beijing, which is like uh, in Jungwon Sun, the Silicon Valley of, of Beijing. And uh, they have been in charge of corporate innovation, helping corporates to, to collaborate with startups, but also for international lending programs. Um, so I also covered in that regard corporate innovation. I worked there with Daimler, Volkswagen, Hitachi, Walmart, and so on and so on. Um, government related, I also lobbied a lot with government organizations, uh, maybe city government or regional government on landing programs and initiatives to help international startups to make it easier to land here. Um, also related to, to uh, in a way. Um, service providers, so that's all this incubation. So I also helped in terms of uh, if you want to register your company, how are you setting up your, your bank account? How do you get visa for your employees and stuff like this? So this was also part of my role. I was not too actively involved in that, but my, my department did that. And uh, something that I've been doing very actively uh, for four years was uh, community building uh, for Startup Grind, which is the largest independent community organization in the world. And I was in charge first of the Beijing chapter. Uh, Startup Grind has 600 chapters worldwide uh, in 124 countries. And um, at one point, I took over also China, uh, managed their 35 cities in China. Uh, so I know the market quite well in that regard. And uh, later, I also took over as APEC director, managing every country in between Azerbaijan up to New Zealand. Uh, so if you have uh, any questions in that regard about Indonesia, Philippines, Japan, Korea, you can also feel free to ask me. Um, Recently, I have joined more and more uh, programs like German Accelerator, which is a German government um, initiative to bring uh, growth stage startups A, B, and later stage to China. And I help them there uh, to, to match make with the right people. Uh, also, I'm a mentor at Plug and Play um, uh, for Korean government, for Blockchain Accelerator in Korea. And I'm part of the Innovation Council for Walmart uh, Food Innovation uh, Pipeline. And uh, the only two things that I've not done uh, I'm not an investor yet, and I did not work at, at a university. These are the only two blocks at a startup ecosystem that I've not tapped myself into. Now you know like where I'm coming from. Before that, uh, I used to be a strategy consultant helping mid-sized companies to enter the, the Chinese market. Um, yeah, so that's my background. So these are the building blocks uh, that we are going to talk about uh, today. Uh, first, we start about the ecosystem having an overview, which is quite hard because China's big, but we try to do that. Um, okay, so first one is, if you want to get an overview of, of entire China, uh, just imagine uh, that this is a deep dive into 30 countries. So you have the um, uh, European Union, for example, you have so many countries. If you want to dive into France, if you want to dive into Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, each of these ecosystems is complex. And that is the same with China. It's not, there is Beijing and Shenzhen. There are so many parts of China that are very diverse, very different focuses. And you have to keep that in mind that China is not this um, homogeneous kind of country where you can say everything is the same. Every state has the economic power of, um, of countries in Europe or in the world. So uh, for example, we have here, Finland has the uh, eco economic power of Dalian, um, or Shenzhen has that of Sweden. And if, um, if we really dive into every ecosystem of China, we would have to do this for a week. But I try to do that on a more shallow level. Um, if you have any in-depth questions about that, I'm also more uh, than happy to, to dive into that. One thing that I wanna say upfront is, if you wanna enter China, you need to have a clear China strategy. Um, you, you need to understand how you want to enter. Do not just go and say, hey, the opportunity is great. There are a lot of people. There, there's a lot of demand for what I need. That's not a good strategy. 
um, you need to think deeper about that. And also the EU SME uh, Center helps you with uh, developing something stronger. You need a strong commitment. One mistake that I see very often happening from European and international startups is I want to enter China through only distribution or I will do something like maybe have some person there. If you want to do that, you need to be all in. There is no way around. China is nothing that you just do on the side. Um, you need a diversified approach for each region. That's important. So if you want to enter Beijing, you enter Beijing. That's not China. So every city, every region, you need to have a different approach. Uh, and at one point, you need a Chinese team. Do not think you can do that by yourself if you really attempt to like enter the Chinese market and, and cover it. Um, just some simple things on, on the beginning. Um, by the way, although this is again something where you can say something in between saying like Yelta, that's nonsense what you say. But I hope it's not. Um, yeah, and then um, of course China is big, and uh, sometimes people think, okay, I'm going to Shanghai or I'm going to Shenzhen. But if you if you think about, it, you're not just entering, uh, not just entering a 20 million people uh, city. You are entering cluster regions. These regions usually have 100, 150 million people that you can enter, depending if you're in B two C or B two B. But the markets are vast. And sometimes it's worth looking beyond the first year cities and also looking into other cluster regions, which still have 100 million people, um, especially if you look there into Chengdu or Chongqing, uh, if you're somewhat related to Belt and Road, uh, something you should not put aside, which can also be very interesting. <clears throat> so here's something about the, um, the startup ecosystem globally. This is from uh, Startup Genome, the largest um, startup ecosystem report in the world. I've been uh, gathering data for them for three years as China expert, and I've also helped them to interview the entrepreneurs here. And uh, China has actually two uh, cities in the top 20 list, which are Beijing and Shanghai. Um, they are not so different actually to all the other cities. So from Europe, there are uh, London, uh, what else do we have? Amsterdam, Paris, Berlin, uh, and that's it. Right, But if you compare right now these ecosystems, Beijing and Shanghai differentiate in, in one aspect heavily from the others, which is connectedness. And this is something that you need to be aware of. Connectedness means you interview the founders and you ask them, who do you know as other, other founders? And if you ask a Chinese founder, they will say, I know other Chinese founders. They will not say, I know a German founder or a French founder. That is connectedness. So it measures how international connected are the founders to other regions. If you're in Amsterdam and you ask the founders, who do you know? They will say, I know someone from Germany. I know someone from Italy because the market is so slow, uh, so small, right? So China is just so vast. All the Chinese founders are connected to Chinese founders. And the amount of foreign entrepreneurs being in China and doing business in China is still nearly non-existent in a statistical scale. Um, be aware of that. So that also means you need to learn how to be localized and to be connected to local, uh, to international communities that you find them, that you find uh, entrepreneurs like Ivo or myself in certain cities. The rest um, is, is not so uh, different. So you get a lot of money uh, in, in terms of funding, uh, good access in those cities. Um, I have more about that. And let's dive deeper into this. So usually how you measure startup ecosystems is the output. Uh, you look at um, how many unicorns did they produce or how many Aeron startups are there. And um, of course, you're all aware that China is not uh, like uh, at the bottom of the list, they're leading it. So you have currently 227 unicorns um, that are uh, Chinese unicorns. And uh, that is 37%. Uh, that's... Uh, just, I think now they should have overtaken uh, uh, the US with 38% um, because China, in China, it takes around two years to create a unicorn. And in the US, it's 2.5 uh, years to produce a unicorn. So uh, just by, by math, sooner or later, China will, uh, will overtook this. I have here Germany in there um, uh, because, yeah, I'm, I'm from Germany originally. Uh, Germany has 12 unicorns. I think there are now 14, if I uh, read the, the news um, from the last couple of days, but it doesn't matter so much. So 12 is, is not much in China terms. And rest of the world is 21%. So there is a lot happening in China, a lot of output. And um, a lot of people also ask me about, okay, where do they come from? What industries do they belong to? 
And um, most important thing that you should take away from this uh, pie chart is they, uh, the top ones are e-commerce, automotive, and AI. However, be careful about this because if you look at the startups, the unicorns in China, they are uh, usually like krakens. What that means is they are not in one industry only. They usually go and uh, develop super apps or super ecosystems where they start maybe with e-commerce, but then they start diving into entertainment, into healthcare, into sports, into uh, any other region. So all of these uh, unicorns, they start with e-commerce and are accounted for that, but they create these super apps around themselves. So that is something you should be aware of. That's very unique for China, not so common in, in other parts of the world. So if, if you have a Spotify or something like this, they will stick to what they, they are good at. But in China, they develop these different business, um, business arms. Okay, and um, this one is probably important for all of you because uh, you might think, hmm, I don't wanna come to China. I'm just listening to this to figure out mm, what China is and maybe I will come or not. But if you look at this chart, um, it hasn't started too far along that uh, China uh, Chinese unicorns um, uh, came to be. So it only started in 2014 and it, it increased every year. And what happens now is 70% of these unicorn companies do not wanna stay only in China. They wanna conquer the world. And they are unicorns in any industry that all of you cover. So sooner or later, they will say, I want to come to Europe, or I want to come to the US. So you will be confronted with something that you might not understand in the next two or three years or five years with a speed that you're not familiar with. And this is a key takeaway where maybe China is something that you should have on your radar to just learn how things are done here, that you can be more competitive in the future. Uh, be, be aware of that because 70% of them wants to come to uh, abroad. Okay, um, this one is the supply system. Uh, again, it's very hard to do that for entire China. I tried to break that down into uh, simple parts, uh, first year cities and uh, how the Chinese government calls them new first year cities. New first year cities are second year cities, but they are pushed heavily through the government and government budget uh, to become on a similar level like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, or Guangzhou, which are the first year cities. Uh, but that's an official terminology they are currently using. Uh, using. It's uh, new first year cities. And um, what you see here, most, most foreign entrepreneurs usually eye on Beijing or Shanghai, um, few on Shenzhen, uh, and uh, I would say the least know about Guangzhou. Um, but uh, I think all of them have the benefits. Uh, I have a very simple comparison of these ecosystems on the left in terms of market readiness for startups. Um, of course, the first year cities are ready. So it's no difference if you come to, I would say, New York, London, or Beijing. You get funding here, you get incubators here, you get corporates here. Um, everything is at your fingertip. All of them know how to deal with startups. Um, however, it's local. Be, it's, it's, uh, so it's not like New York, you can go and speak every, to everyone in English, right? Um, but that's a different topic. Uh, new first year cities are a, bit, a little bit less um, advanced in that regard, especially if you look at Hangzhou. Um, I would say Hangzhou is more advanced than most of the first year cities actually uh, right now, because they have a very digital and very uh, international friendly approach. And um, in terms of resources, if you are looking for grants or uh, anything from the government, it's very hard to get that in, in first cities because it's very competitive. The Beijing will not easily give you a lot of money unless you're like uh, first class of Europe, um, top 10 in, in uh, IoT or something like this. Then they will put out the big money. But getting grants is easier in new first cities, so the smaller ones. Um, ecosystem maturity is similar to market readiness, uh, talent access, that's one problem. So uh, you could get very good grants and, and resources in, let's say, Haikou, uh, which is in, in Hainan, or uh, in, let's say, Ningbo or Suzhou or Nanjing. But if you need talent, it's very hard to get that. Uh, and uh, if you want talent, you should stick to thirsty cities. However, be aware that the, uh, the annual salary in thirsty cities is crazy. You pay for a really good uh, developer around um, 
50 to 70,000 RMB, depending on the seniority, which is like 10,000 euros uh, per month. And um, uh, it's very competitive because all of the top unicorns, uh, they have their eyes already on the top performance uh, from universities first day they start. And you're competing with them. So getting these top technology talents is very tough in these markets. Uh, funding, I, I would say it's, it's easy if you're here and if you're really committed, committed to the market, um, getting money in the Chinese market is, well, not harder or easier than in other, any other market, but money is available. And if you know how to localize, you can successfully pitch. And Ivo was one example for that, but he will share more about that a bit later. Just okay. One, just yeah. one comment for the previous slide, Jelte. Just yeah. last week, I remember I was having lunch with one with another startup. Can you put the previous slide? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, so for example, in there are uh, getting if you get the money, for example, in Suzhou, I was I was talking with one entrepreneur, so he could get around uh, one to three million renminbi, so he can push his business. But there are some consequences. For example, in exchange of that, you have to have your company registered in Suzhou. By the way, Suzhou is just on top of Shanghai. I don't know if you guys can see it. You can see Shanghai, then Suzhou. So that that area that city that region they are trying now to bring talent so here there is opportunity for foreigners as well foreign business in even smes as well so they want you to bring the address register there and then can give you the money now also so it's, it's not sound so easy uh, they they told me that also they require that in your company balance you need to have a certain minimum of amount of money then they can give you the the next amount and that was just yeah, last week. Somebody was telling me about the about the, the conditions. So just to let you know, guys, there are some conditions in order to get the money. It's not that straightforward. Yeah, um, I will dive a bit deeper into uh, grants and and um, uh, things like this in in a later part of the slides mm -hmm. uh, because I also have some things that are relevant to the, in that regard. Um, also, one thing that I will mention, and I think I do not mention that later, so I mention it here, uh, is about your company registration. And if you're a technology startup, it matters what you have in the front. So both Arcadu and my own company have Beijing Kiji Gongsi in front, which means Beijing, uh, Beijing technology company. That is a high standard. If you go and you do business in entire China, people take you more serious because you have a Beijing in front, your first year city. If you have Chengdu and you go to Beijing, people will think less of you. This is something that you have to fight for um, if you're in certain industries and it's harder to do that. Be aware of that. It's not always the case, but it's something that you should um, know if you register a company in Suzhou or other new first year cities. Yeah, yeah so this is one of the first... Um, uh, first exchanges I've already started, which is nice. Um, but if if you uh, see these slides about China is big, China is diverse, how do you usually help um, other founders that approach you and say like, hey, where should I go? Uh, how should I read the market? Um, anything that you want to add to that? Uh, so my case, can I? Yeah. Can I? Okay. Um... I think that, uh, for example, in uh, if if someone, I, I'm not sure about the audience. If there's anyone that considered him to to start up to start the the startup, but in my case, uh, I just, uh, maybe I can tell a little bit about me. So then I'm going to sure. explain a little bit about the startup ecosystem. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, I'm Avaro from Acado. Uh, uh, we are a, a life translation technology company offering life translation uh, uh, technologies for virtual platforms and also for organizations. And I started like three years ago in, in Beijing. No? I was in a university studying an MBA and I, I couldn't understand the professors uh, talking in, in, Chine in Chinese. So I built myself my own prototype. So the professor can talk in Chinese, then I can understand and read in Spanish. I did it from Chinese to Spanish, no? from like voice recognition and, and translation. And with that, I um, started uh, to participate in some competitions. That is one good thing about the startup ecosystem here in Beijing. There are tons of startup competitions. So with that prototype, 
it was a very simple prototype, but I participated in many competitions uh, from the university where I was studying and also from the, from the city itself. Um, I got in some of them to the final, and I think in one competition, actually is the one that Laura have put in the first slide, in the first slide where they show me with a microphone. Actually, in that competition, I got the second prize, and it was sponsored by Facebook. So that was kind of my first moment to, to, to my one is I put one step into the official into the startup world because in that competition, I got money from Facebook and also in that competition, there were investors. So it was the first time that some investors approached me and not only investors, also incubators. So I think this is another thing that uh, founders need to, need to maybe uh, keep an eye on. No? Like there are many incubators in Beijing that they are willing to provide you resources to help you, incubate you, to help you to grow. And that is what happened, happened to me. Jete, can I go more deep or you think that is enough? I can be agile to whatever you want to say. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so yeah, then to keep to the story, I, I'm just a guy that have a prototype, got some money and now got investors saying that sounds interesting. Your business plan sucks, but seems there is a potential market there. And then there are also incubators. Alvaro, don't talk with investors yet. You better to, we incubate you, uh, we train you, we help you, we give you some advice, we can polish you, you pitch deck, and then maybe you can fundraise. So I choose the option of incubators because uh, uh, with investors later, we are gonna go more deep how I fundraise, but uh, incubators here in China, they are really willing to help. Well, that's, that's the goal, no? Uh, to, to, get, to get the startups and to help them. So um, that's how I entered into the into an one incubator in Beijing and the incubator I, I like a lot because they give me uh, mentors. They give me one-on-one -on -one sessions with lawyers, with consultant companies. So many different things that when you start a business, no, you need to consider no? accounting, uh, uh, the invoice, uh, the fundraising, but also mm. other, other things. So this incubator gave me a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions. So I was getting this free advice. To, to understand better the, the whole of a company. And at the same time, the incubator also organized a lot of road shows, no? many competitions where I can pitch and I can have in front of me also investors. So that was how was my, my, my beginning as a startup founder in Beijing, is getting into an incubator, getting the advice, and then of course also developing my market. At the end, that's the most important thing, no matter how yeah. well connected you are, if your product sucks, then it's difficult to, to grow. So yeah, yeah. is that did good? It, yeah. did, it, no? did it ever come to your mind to change direction and go to Nanjing or Shanghai? Uh, why did you choose Beijing and why did you stick to Beijing? Oh, so I choose Beijing because I was studying, uh, it's called Tsinghua University. It's a, it's a good university in Beijing. Uh, with good resources and the incubator there, they offered me to help and it was free. Seems that incubator for all the students in the campus, they give them free office. So suddenly I had an office up to five seats. So if I had to grow my team and I had all these resources that I, that I explained, of course there were, when I joined some competitions, there is always someone from Shanghai, from Shenzhen telling you, hey Alvaro, why don't you move your address to Shanghai? We also can give you this and that. But I liked uh, to be in the university because also the university was a, a good place to test my prototype. They already knew me as well. I started there, I was one student there. So because of this reason, I stick into Beijing. Hmm. Yeah, um, this is also one thing that uh, um, coming back to the funding story and for those of you in the audience who are uh, thinking about getting to China and getting funding, um, you can get local Chinese investors, you can get international investors that are operating here. However, all of them want you to be China savvy. They want you to be ready to have done your homework. So what Alvaro now says about knowing about how to do, how to issue an invoice, um, how to do accounting, uh, how to uh, set up a contract and things like this. Uh, these are things that all the investors expect you to do. Nobody, and that is a quite common term, is wants to hold your hand. Um, so they want people who get this knowledge by themselves. And once they see you are 100% committed to the market and have learned the basics, then they start supporting you with the big money, uh, not before. Um, I have some more slides about that later. Um, yeah, but 
I mean, um, I think if, if Alvaro, uh, you would have now the choice, uh, would you still stick to Beijing or do you see anything in the market happening uh, where you say, hey, I would maybe go to Nanjing or Hangzhou or Shanghai? I think it's, it's what you said. I think maybe I never got a grant from the government. Like I see the government giving 1 million, 2 million to other companies to just to help them. They want 2 million renminbi. How much is that in euros? 100,000 euros? 100,000 hmm. euros without equity. They don't ask equity in exchange. They don't ask anything just to support. I think that's, that's, that's great. It's like your first round of investment without giving equity. I th that's great. So in Beijing, I couldn't. I tried. But as Jelta said, I, I am not a PhD with 10 years and with a Nobel Prize. So it's very difficult to get that. Well, I'm not Elon Musk yet. So, so that's why yet. I, I, yet. I always had to, to do it by, by myself. But I think I would consider, because now that I've been more into the startup ecosystem, I can see some people going to other places and get the grant. But of course, as you said, that was the talent. Now you need to recruit people there. No? And now you need to be registered there. Sometimes they ask to you to be there. So there are yeah. many conditions, but it could be an option because suddenly you get a hundred thousand euros to start the business, right? If you have an online business, internet business, then it shouldn't matter where you are. Yeah, could be an option. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Adol. Um, Let's go forward. So um, we're in China. We look a bit at incubators, accelerators, uh, co-working spaces, high-tech zones. Um, and tech parks, um, I have some slides prepared there, but I tried to walk through that uh, quickly because in general, um, again, as I mentioned, China is vast. Every city has like 20 million or something people. And what I have here is the example of what the Beijing startup ecosystem looks like, the most visible players in the market and the blocks uh, of an ecosystem that I mentioned uh, right in the beginning. So you have... Um, uh, the the uh, mandatory building blocks of a startup ecosystem are investors. They give you money, of course, incubators and accelerators, um, corporate innovators. So if you want to work with uh, Volkswagen and build a prototype, you should know where to find them. Uh, governments, uh, community organizations, um, service providers, and universities. Why is there now this pink triangle? In China, uh, and that's something that I've learned over the last couple of years, there is a minimum va a validation point of entry that international startups need to have. If you do not have that, it's very hard to get actually into an ecosystem uh, in any. And um, what I think the minimum is are incubators and accelerators. So I've all had access to Tsinghua XLab, which is also a university in that regard. But without that, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to start. He wouldn't have gotten, have gotten the resources, the knowledge, the, the mentorship, and so on and so on. Governments. I truly believe there is no way around the government. Uh, I have another a proportion of slides about that. Um, you can do without, but you will not grow without. You need to understand that, but you need to be aware when you need to know about them. A lot of people start with the government and they realize it's not going anywhere. That's the wrong approach. I have some slides about when you start doing that and when not. Community organizations, that is mostly important for uh, any international company or a startup that wants to enter here. It's not so relevant for Chinese companies actually. Um, but if you think about you are um, a startup from Spain and you want to enter the Chinese market, how do you do that? You need friends. You need people you trust. You need to find your ways to hire people. How do you do, do that? You communicate to other people and say, like, where can I hire a general manager? Where can I hire a, an accountant? Where can I go to events to learn about stuff? That is what you all find in communities. And there are very active international communities and local communities that you can tap into. And I think if you are strong in these three, you're well prepared for China. Um, if you are now a well-funded startup, so you're A round or B round in Europe uh, by an investor, you should have a strong reach towards your network within China. However, one thing that I've also realized from Europe uh, especially is that if you have big investment, so let's say you have uh, three uh, investors, angel or later stage, they are usually all from your home country. They have a very weak connection towards international markets. And it might be that they will advise you, oh no, go to the US first. That is why I did not put investors here because 
you need to diversify your entry strategy. Um, so even if you're like well-funded and a lot of German startups that I'm working with, uh, they are in B round and they have all German investors, they do not know and understand China and they're afraid of China. So they, they encourage you not to go to China, but just because they do not know. And that is, uh, if you're in earlier stage, try to diversify your investor portfolio, your advisory portfolio, get some international support. Do not have always the same uh, culture, language, and nationality in there. I spend a little bit too much time on here. Any city in, in China uh, kind of looks like this. So if you look at first year or new first year cities, they have uh, a network like this where you can tap into. If you wanna know anything about a certain city, just let me know. I'm not gonna dive into 25 cities now. Uh, not enough time for that, but uh, that's my opinion. Maybe Alvaro, do you think this uh, minimum validation triangle makes sense? Or you, you think uh, you should account also some other uh, player into this? Uh, no, I think uh, makes makes completely sense uh, for me. And I think in my case, uh, the communities, I think it helped me a lot. Because for example, I wanted to know about lawyers. No, like when I was closing my my second round of investment from an investment Chinese investment fund, how do I know uh, to who? I don't know a lawyer, and how can I find like an extra? an ultra lawyer or someone then in the communities there are many events about the startups i joined there and there is always somebody that can forward to someone so immediately through communities i could find a lot of um how to say network contacts in different yeah. in different fields that helped me a lot and also even for hiring but well i'm a, i'm in a startup way no so find people that are willing to suddenly join jump into a startup journey which is not easy uh, i found them also in, in communities um, yeah, regarding government, I didn't got too much, but maybe, but maybe the, the the support that they give for a startup visa, because you have to live here, right? You need to be legally living, and there are some some things that you need, like the visa. So now China offers a startup visa. That is something that is is, is very smooth. Because before I was working in Microsoft, so when I had to get my visa, I had to give it to the HR department, but it takes a long time. Now the startup visa is very fast. Actually, they try to make it fast to help foreigners that are doing his, their own business here. Um, yeah. just, just one thing, there is a question from the audience. Can yeah. I read it? Yeah, of course. Okay. It's, a, it's a question from Ivy Cruz. Uh, question for Alvaro. Was your MBA all part of the plan to place a product in the Chinese market or things just happened when you joined and won in that competition? Uh, things, things didn't happen. So I, I, I was, in the time I joined the MBA, I was already six years in China. Uh, you know that things that happen in life that you get lost and you don't know what to do with your life. So I was at that moment. So then I decided to go from the corporate to the, how to say, the education world, to, to the study world. I wanted to study, to learn new things. And that's why I joined the MBA. My purpose was to study, to learn more, but also because when I read the brochures about the MBA, they mention a lot of things about the startups and competitions. And I'm a lab person that like to build solutions to solve problems. Just one example, I was going from finance class to accounting class, and in the middle, there was an IBM competition. And of course, I miss accounting class, and I went to the IBM competition, and it was good, actually. If, if you put the map, Yelte, with the cities, at the end, they offer me, uh, give me kind of an offer for Xi'an. Can you see? Can you guys see here? Yeah, Oops. Xi'an. Sorry. So, so it was very interesting. So no, IBM have a development research center in Xi'an and they go to Beijing, to the capital, to do a competition. And then the ones that we got to the final, they kind of give us an offer or they ask us to invite us to go there. So we, we want to keep working on software development. So yeah, but at the end, as I said, it was just a coincidence that I started the startup. Cool. Hope I answered your question. Thank you. For yeah, thank us. you so much for, for asking the question. So don't be shy about that. Write anything that you want to ask us and we, we will interrupt um, to, to dive into this. Okay, um, so here are some uh, examples from, from Beijing. Uh, and please be aware, I come from a city that has uh, 2,000 inhabitants in Germany. And uh, these numbers are now from Beijing. There are 200,000 incubators. Um, this number sounds crazy, but if you go into any district like Chaoyang or Haidian, uh, you will find hundreds of these incubators focusing on different parts. 
um, I would say 90% of them are local. Only 10% of them have an angle that somewhat deals with uh, international um, entrepreneurs. Uh, but this is just, it's so much, much happening here. And this is the same for all the first year cities, the same amount of innovation incubators you will find there. Um, Beijing also has uh, 670 venture capital firms. Uh, I saw some numbers, yeah, 20,000 angel investors. Uh, I think that's also one reason uh, because there are uh, the, the highest concentration of billionaires in a city is in Beijing. So a lot of rich people. And I think one, one very important point here is also the 5G stations, uh, which is an indicator for uh, how technology savvy and ready a nation is. And there are th uh, 37,000. So if you're currently with a 5G phone here, in most parts of the city, you have uh, 5G. And uh, this just shows like how much innovation capacity there is. Also one important thing about uh, Beijing, there are 300 uh, tech startups established every day. So the city that I'm from, four days, and it's all covered with like startups, right? Uh, there are over a thousand research institutions uh, for talent, it's perfect. You have 90 plus uh, top universities. If you want to find any talent in AI or so on, you go to Tsinghua. Um, also, any kind of engineering, you go to, you go to Beihang or Beida. Um, national high-tech enterprises, that's one qualification, how they uh, look at first-tier innovative companies. And if you're into uh, biotech, healthcare, or so on, there are a lot of national lab laboratories that you can also tap into. And this now is only Beijing. Um, you will find the same amount of numbers in, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, and in Guangzhou. And uh, that's why I didn't want to dive too much into the new first year cities. So here are some numbers in terms of uh, comparison of the first year cities uh, with the major focus at the end on startups. So uh, in terms of population, they all don't differentiate too much, right? So it's like 20, like 18 to 25 million uh, in population. That's official numbers. If you look at inefficient numbers, Beijing would probably be around uh, 30 million. And I think it's the same for uh, for any of the others as well. In terms of GDP uh, as well, it's it's high. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not an economist. I'm not going to dive too much into that. I think most important is the uh, per capita disposable income. People here are wealthy. They can spend a lot of money on, on consumption and on things. And uh, in that regard, also, they don't divert too much. In terms of uh, startup output, these numbers are from Jing Data, the largest uh, startup uh, intelligence platform in China, and there are 134,000 startups in China, uh, in Beijing, I'm sorry, uh, which is first. Then Shanghai um, is second in that regard, 112,000. Uh, Shenzhen has 85, and Guangzhou has uh, 56. One important thing here is the growth, the, the GDP growth. Um, a lot of people say everything happen, uh, everything is po uh, possible in Beijing or Shanghai, but those markets have already saturated in a certain regard. Um, there is not much happening anymore. Shenzhen in that regard is a booming city. So what you currently see there, everyone wants to get rich. Everyone wants to be part of something. They are all moving. And uh, this trend of starting up is a big, big thing in Shenzhen. So if you want to be part of a hot uh, period, of growth, of entrepreneurship growth, I would uh, recommend you to check out Shenzhen and Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen more because it's uh, it's more uh, international savvy and friendly in that regard. But uh, this uh, this growth is there. It's not so much in Beijing. There is still a lot ha happening, but we are too close to the government in that regard. We are not as uh, sexy. Uh, Shanghai is an, is another thing. It's very international and uh, but also saturated. And the business there is not about entrepreneurship. It's about uh, multinational uh, corporations and so on. And um, then one of the questions that I often get is like, where should I go? Where should I start? Uh, what are the focus areas uh, of each of the cities? Uh, this is the technical answer. Uh, so the government has certain focus areas uh, that they have announced uh, for their cities. Beijing in that regard has new generation of um, IT, uh, semiconductors, intelligent equipment, mobility, especially AI. I feel like, so in my industry, I feel like 
everyone is somewhat about AI. And uh, since there are so many universities and um, research departments, a lot of uh, science and technology um, uh, support. So if you're entering, uh, by the way, any of these cities and you're from any of these verticals uh, in terms of uh, sector or industry, it's easier to get funding. It's easier to get to resources. Um, but that, uh, what that means, I have uh, some more in-depth slides about that. I'm not going too much into that, but if you're in interested in this, I can share it with you. Uh, Shanghai, in that regard, focusing on IoT, uh, healthcare, uh, also automotive, high-end equipment, which is aviation-related, uh, smart materials, uh, consumer goods. Um, let me take a short break here. Uh, people ask me then, okay, is there no AI in Shanghai? or is there no healthcare in Beijing? And the answer is no. Uh, uh, the, the answer is uh, there is. So in any of these uh, big cities of 20 million people, you will find nearly any industry represented in, in any of these cities. So you can also go to Hangzhou and everything that's covered here will be covered there. Uh, you can also find robotic startups in Beijing. You can find um, like any industry that you want there. 20 million is bigger than most countries in Europe. So uh, don't base a decision on where to go on this. Uh, go there and get to know the city. And uh, when you like it somewhere and you have good partners on the ground, you should start. Uh, Shenzhen uh, on, on hardware, also a next generation of IT, uh, smart manufacturing, appliances, uh, anything hardware related actually is uh, so is, is located in Shenzhen. Uh, if you're into petrochemical, so uh, you can also go to Shenzhen in that regard and textile industry. And uh, Guangzhou differentiates a bit. Uh, they are also similar like Shenzhen focusing on manufacturing, IoT, uh, but a lot on FinTech and service industry, uh, a lot on marine and ship uh, innovation and digital economy. Digital economy, I must honestly say, I'm not really sure what that means in that regard, because all of them are part of digital economy. Um, but that's what the government wrote down. I can give you the, the slides with the details of each of these descriptions that you know uh, what the focuses are, if you're interested in this. But again, uh, each of the cities has nearly everything to offer that you need. And uh, you, you will find clients in those cities uh, or resources if you're in any of these industries. So now diving a bit into uh, the output of each of the first year cities. Uh, so you see here, the numbers do not match uh, 130,000 uh, startups that I first showed. And now if you do the math, uh, the, the few numbers that are here on the right do not add up. Why that is, is we, we took only the startups from 2017 and um, uh, those that are still alive or currently receiving funding. So that's at its core, let's say around uh, six to 7,000 uh, startups that are really worth mentioning. The others are somewhat statistical, I don't know, might be zombies, might be uh, something else. However, the, the amount of unicorns is the highest in, uh, in I would even say the world. Uh, 78 uh, unicorns came from Beijing um, and 80% of them actually came from Zhongguan Sun uh, science parks. So if you want to be close to the Silicon Valley of China, uh, check out Zhongguan Sun, and uh, they have parks all over Be Beijing, also a few outside of Beijing. And um, yeah, not going too much into the names here, uh, anything covered. Then uh, in terms of Shanghai, uh, it's only half, 43 unicorns. Uh, output is also not so important. It's like, of course, angel and A round investment is high. And then the later rounds are slower, uh, are lower. Um, probably more interesting is the amount of, of unicorns that are coming out of the cities. Uh, Shenzhen only has 18, um, so still a lot of room, but Shenzhen is pushed very heavily from the national government to, to grow, also to, be, to become a counter um, uh, way to, to Hong Kong and other parts in, in the region. So you will see in the next uh, five to 10 years that this number will uh, quadruple probably uh, and, and be more like Beijing in that regard. Uh, Guangzhou, even though most people do not know where it is or what it stands for, has 12. Um, and uh, uh, probably most 
important one is Pony AI. They already do uh, self-driving cars on the streets uh, live and test that. And um, I think that will also be one of the first cities where, where they will deploy uh, entire full self-driving cars in, in the market. Um, they speak Cantonese in, in Guangzhou, um, which is not Mandarin in that regard. It's a different language. Uh, unless it's written, then, then they can understand each other. Uh, and again, it's not the most international city in that regard. If you're interested in Guangzhou, um, who you should check out is Brink. Uh, IO. Uh, they are one of the top accelerators, international ones in the regions, and that's the only one that's based in Guangzhou doing something for uh, cross-border. Um, I put in Hangzhou here, even though it's a new first year city, has 25. Uh, nearly every uh, 25 unicorns. Nearly every unicorn that is uh, coming out of Hangzhou is somewhat related to uh, Alibaba. Um, so uh, any, any AI, IoT, digital um, uh, startup is uh, partly invested by Alibaba in that regard. And they are building an entire digital city there. A lot of money to get from the city, uh, free housing, grants. Um, they're putting a lot of uh, friendly grants out there for international entrepreneurs. Definitely something that you should check out. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we covered that a bit, uh, the which location to choose. Um, anything else that comes to your mind from the slides that I showed, anything that I forgot to mention or you would like to share? I will. Um, um, well, if, if in the audience there are founders, um, I think the Beijing, the, the top cities that you mentioned are the one more active in terms of um, communities and also events and also maybe competitions. And these are the places where you can meet the investors. They are the main investors are there as well. So I, I, I still vouch for the top tier cities based on my experience. Yeah. That's how I got my meetings with investors. Yeah. Um, also, I would can, also can I, not. Hmm? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, so sorry. You continue because, because I, I was about to talk about funding, but no, this is not funding yet. Sorry. Oh, we can talk about funding. We had that uh, uh, before. It's, late, it's later, no? So it's, it's, it's fine. I, I, I can wait. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing that I also want to share is uh, be aware that it's harder in second and third tier cities to uh, thrive as a foreign entrepreneur. You need to have definitely uh, Chinese staff on the ground. In Beijing, you can also have a foreign GM uh, in Shanghai and so on. That's fine. But if you go to Nanjing or so on, you need to have a local team. There is no way, a way around that. I did not cover too much about high-tech zones and tech parks. Um, I think uh, in that regard, the EU SME Center has a very vast uh, data set uh, to share with the audience if you're interested which technology parks are out there. Um, this is a different area. So if you're into greenfield or brownfield or uh, something like this, you want to set up your production facilities here, um, they will be able to help you more in that regard. I'm eyeing today more on the entrepreneurship um, angle, right? Okay, so how should you start partners, investors, and clients? That's uh, for you, Ivo. And um, one important thing that I always say is, uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur, um, so for those people here in the audience who, are, who have started their own business, and if you're, let's say, A-round, um, you came from an idea, you developed your MVP, a minimum viable product, showed it to, to some clients, you got some investment or you got uh, enough revenue that you can pull up, and you have uh, usually already enough revenue that you can stomach the access to a second market. If you have a second or third market, second or third country, you're in growth stage. That means, uh, so usually growth is measured by weekly growth, but I will, I will keep it here uh, way simpler. So the moment you're not just in your home country, but let's say in the US or India or Japan or something, then you're in growth stage. What happens if you come to China is you're not, so let's say you are in your home market, a growth startup, and you come to China, you are not a growth startup here. You are early. You need to start from scratch. You need to build your MVP. Because whatever you know about how your industry works, how everything goes, 
you need to put that aside and take a step back. You need to think about what are your what are your customers? What is the market? How can you enter? What kind of partnerships can you set up? You need to start from scratch. Too many people come and say, we are the top of the industry. We know everything. We know how to do it. They come to the market and say, I'm going to do it here exactly as I've done it in Silicon Valley or US or Canada or some other developed country. That's not how it works. You will fail 100%. So you need to take a step back and, and send some engineers, technical people to understand what is needed in the market and how can you adapt that. And you need to have someone who is really good with strategies and partner access. And with that, you create a new MVP and you create a strategy for the market. Do not try to just distribute stuff to China. That will not work. Um, and then in China, you start in one city, Beijing, and you're still early stage, you need to grow. So you get from Beijing to Shanghai to Shenzhen, and then slowly you start covering the market. So you're not a growth startup in China, you start from zero. And you need to keep this entrepreneurship mind in your head. You need to constantly solve problems and move forward. And one thing that I realized is a lot of the entrepreneurs that I meet that are in A and B round, they forget what it means to be an entrepreneur. They're like, Oh, but I have 10 million to spend. I just do it. That's not how you solve problems. You have to sit down and think and brainstorm how you actually build something that people want. That is a different approach. So you have to keep this entrepreneurship spirit in your mind and start from scratch in that regard. And then in China, you can also become established. You can, for example, start with a joint venture and you, you come to an established point and you exit and you go IPO with your daughter company in China. Um, without going IPO with your uh, mother um, startup in that regard. So those are strategies that usually um, make sense. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, either or, because that is a slide that I think is very important. I, I think you said very, yeah, you said very well. Uh, I, I just was wondering from the audience how many uh, founders there are and how many people actually have a business that wants to bring into China. But I don't know. I, can we can actually do that. We can. Uh, okay. We have a poll. Uh, I'm gonna launch it right now, so all the participants are gonna see the poll on the screen oh. right now. And there are three main questions. Is uh, the questions are: Do you work for a startup? Yes or no? Uh, what's your level of knowledge regarding today's topic, so that they understand? Uh, so far, you have been started explaining the the basic background. And then the third question is a little bit about expectations. Um, and we are actually receiving the answer so far. Um, perhaps we can give them a few more seconds just to reply and then... Um, we can analyze it. Sure, let's do the poll. It's happening right now. Uh, okay. I think you perhaps you're seeing your screen, so you are you're just seeing uh, the presentation. Um, so right now we got like uh, over ten responses. Seventy-three uh, percent do not work for a startup. So let's say that uh, they are uh, foreign to the to the startup environment and um, way of working. Uh, the level of knowledge on today's topic, I will say, the majority has a basic knowledge, no zero, but basic while uh, only 17% considers that they have advanced knowledge. And we have only 8% 8 8 of experts. I think maybe we can close the poll right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, so I can also add a few more uh, things, I think in my uh, presentation about uh, not startup related topics so that I do not just walk the, the startup talk, um, but I, I, I will add a few more things in, in the slides then later. Ivor, does it help you, the, the poll? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, yes, some people, concrete example of startups in China, maybe I can tell more details um, later. Yeah. Oh, if okay. you guys have a concrete question, like I have many scars from all the battles I have had here. So you want to know how I did that scar? <laughs> Just ask me. 
I, I don't yeah. know what would you what would you like Delta I tell from from here. I think you explained very well. I think that's the the startup way. No idea MVP early growth established. Um, yeah, I, I met many people also trying to bring the business here, and sometimes it's. I, I personally think knowing the language helps because I that's but that, that's my personal story. Yeah? I personally uh, talking with my clients, talking with my investors, fundraising, uh, talking with my lawyer, everything I do it in Chinese, and that that helps me. And sometimes when I see some foreigners, I I see them frustrated. Because sometimes, I don't know, uh, I, I think it can help you uh, mastering the, the language. Just a, just an advice. Um, uh, this is one thing that I want to say also to the audience. Like, um, Ivo has a unique way how he became the person he is now today. It's very hard to replicate that for international companies, uh, small and medium enterprises or startups. Uh, because not everybody can say, hey, I'm going to start now to become fluent in Chinese. However, what you should learn also from this, even though you, it's hard to replicate it, is you need people like Alvo. You need people who can navigate in this landscape and who you can trust. Either you are the person who can navigate there or you need people like him who can navigate there. Because if you do not do that, you're blind, you're frustrated and you will not go forward. And you will say, China, no, thank you, I will go home. You need that. Right. Um, that's probably a key takeaway. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. I, th no. I, th I think yeah, I think that that you said is is also is also correct. Also, regarding the now that come to my mind regarding the in incubators, um, I, I I'm not sure if that may be inter interesting for the audience, but I remember that I also here in China, at the beginning, I didn't started in the incubator of the university. I started outside of the university in other incubators. Like I just wanted an office to work, to have some people on my team to work. And nothing, nothing is actually free, right? Like everything in life. So I had to, I remember as a personal story, I remember my first office was I have a French, a friend that is French, that he had an office, had a meeting room. So during the weekends, he allowed me and my, and my partner to go to the meeting room to use it as an office so we can discuss. But it lasted, it lasted just like a couple of months because maybe the boss was not happy. So we, we, couldn't, we couldn't use that anymore. It lasts one month. Then I remember I went to a, a, a co-working spaces here in Beijing and some are not cheap, actually. <laughs> the life, the ones that, I don't know. I think the, the life here in Beijing is not that cheap in the center. It can be, I'm from Barcelona, more expensive than the Barcelona and the price I'm paying to some developers here is higher than some developers back in Barcelona as well. So, yeah. so at that time I was struggling, you know, how to get an office. So in my case, since I have this solution for live translation technologies for events and Congress and meetings, I used to offer that for free. I go to one incubator and I tell them, hey, all the events that you're gonna do, I allow you to have free translation, AI translation, and you in exchange, give me a table. <laughs> With a seat, two tables, and two chairs. So that was how I started uh, working. And then, of course, after a few months, suddenly had to pay. So then we we went out from there, and at the end, we ended up in the in the university. I didn't start at the straight forward in the university because at the beginning I was alone. So alone, I was thinking I can work from home. I don't need to come to a co-working space. But in the moment that I had a partner, and he was a Finnish from Finland, he was a Finnish guy, uh, bigger, like a Viking, bigger than me. Then. It was weird to bring him home. No? My wife was not happy. So we had to find a, a place to work together. So yeah, that, that's like an anecdote, how we were in Beijing finding places to work and we work it out. So yeah, that's the yeah. beginning of any entrepreneur is hard. Um, I think this is important both for uh, small and medium enterprises that want to enter China as well as for startups that you can start with one person and this person can start working from home to keep it cheap. But if you really want to be committed, you need to get an office and you need to get them tapping into a network. Uh, you will lose them otherwise. They need to be surrounded by people. So get them a good co-working space. Uh, if you're a startup, get into an incubator. If you're a corporate, get into a WeWork. Just that they, that they have a network and then you can slowly grow from there. Do not try to keep it cheap. And Beijing is not cheap uh, in that regard.
neither is Shanghai or well, Shenzhen is okay, still okay. Yeah. Uh, so far, so far in Beijing, I, I, besides the the university accelerator that that always will give me a meeting room I can use anytime, there is also another institutional organization that also offers a free office for companies that have as a founder a foreigner still you can find some kind of these benefits if you are a foreigner yeah just to let you know yeah yeah um cool uh here are some people that you should know uh i i sometimes just put in some names uh those are community people so if you are really aiming to come to china and you think about shanghai uh go to linkedin check out marian danko or jio tang uh, both of them are more than welcome to to accept your your friend and white and they are very uh community driven people um uh, marian is an entrepreneur from jack uh, and uh, he's one of the best connected people that i know in the region also covering hangzhou and and chongqing pretty well uh, jill leads uh, ladies who tag uh, one of the largest uh, community organizations focusing on um, women and technology and stem and uh, she covers nearly entire China, also, also Singapore and so on. So both very good people to know. And um, what I'm saying here is uh, add them, uh, write to them on, on LinkedIn and say, hey, I want to uh, learn about China. Can we have a call? And they will do, they will say yes. Uh, that's why I put them here. Not everybody would do that, but those two would. And uh, if you're looking, eyeing on Guangzhou, I've always wanted to say something. Yeah, actually, you never introduced me then, but I also know them. So Marian, actually, I also had a coffee in Shanghai at my very beginning. I think when I had my first client in Shanghai, I, I met him as well. And Jill also, she's always doing events in the also ladies who tech, no? promoting yeah. uh, uh, technology also for, for ladies uh, co uh, communities. I think it was also very helpful. Yeah, just to let you know, I also knew them from my site. They are well connected if you want to them to do yeah. some introduction or give you some advice. Yeah, cool. Um, then for Guangzhou, uh, here are uh, some people, Chance uh, Jiang, he is in the smart manufacturing world, super helpful guy, um, always happy to support. Um, and Ade, I think he's now in San Francisco, but he has very, a very, very strong network. He worked for IBM before. Uh, by the way, down there are some quotes about what they think about their home city, where they worked or lived. Um, you can read that later on in the slides. And Mint, um, also a community builder from, um, from Startup Grind. Uh, she works in a SaaS uh, startup right now. Uh, all three are people you should know if you want to learn about Guangzhou. If you are into smart manufacturing, check out Chance. And if you're into internet bridging between China and, and rest of the world, uh, talk to Chance. Uh, good people. Yeah. Uh, Shenzhen. Without Jan, uh, I would have not like joined, I think that quickly into the inter entrepreneurship world. He was the APEC manager of Stargram before, one of the best people you can know. He will help you to connect and to open doors. Um, really good guy. Uh, now Sheen, she's part of uh, Startup Grind, very heavy in the, uh, in the content um, and B2C world. Uh, also very happy to, to help you to connect and Grace is one of the strongest people you can know in both the Chinese and local uh, and international community in Shenzhen. She works with all the chambers, uh, anything entrepreneurship related, uh, nobody better to know than her. Her quote is uh, short, but her expertise is like massive, way more than I have actually. So add them on LinkedIn if you can. And here are some, uh, some of my friends from Beijing. Uh, Yasmin, she's the current APEC director of Startup Grind. Um, she's from Germany. Uh, Ka is from Georgia. He now moved to Shanghai, working for China Accelerator. And Sabrina is also co-director of Startup Grind Beijing. That's enough praise. Um, you get the slides later, add them, and they are nice people. So uh, this is a standard operating procedure, which I put together, which I think explains very good how you as a foreign um, also SME, but most likely startup should enter. Learn the basics. Um, so learn about Fa Piao, um, learn about accounting and so on and so on. Uh, do that with your SME center. 
define your your strategy how to enter do you want a woofy do you want a joint venture do you want to have an r&d center which is highly underestimated uh, i think do you want to want to enter through distribution once you choose that next step is you shortlist cities and the best thing that you can do if COVID wouldn't be here just come here and travel and the moment you feel like this city feels like home that's where you should set your your roots if you have friends there, you have some, some connections, you will find everything that you need. Um, unless you're a high tech, uh, then you should do a bit deeper research on is there talent? Because most people, if you go to Hainan, you will be like, oh, that's amazing, uh, but you will find no talent there. And <laughs> that's, that's one of the toughest, uh, toughest things. Then next step is you need to build relations to the top incubators and accelerators. Um, because they will provide you with the resources to how you set up your company how you get to investors, what competitions are out there. They will help you with that. And then from that, you should get a good friend. Because without a good friend on the ground, you will have a very hard time as a foreign entrepreneur or SME to really be successful here. That might be that you have someone from the chamber really being there for you, caring about your business, caring about the problem that you're solving, caring about you entering the market. Um, better have two or three. You will need that sooner or later to rely on them and to cross-validate information. Then you start joining a summit. You can join a summit, a demo day, an acceleration program, not before. A lot of people just start doing that without doing their homework before and having their strategy ready. And um, only then you can start registering a company. So if you win something in Beijing or Shenzhen or so and so on, then you start. And then you start actually talking to the local governments, not before. A lot of people get into these tours by the government saying, okay, let's come to Nanjing. And then you, you commit, you, you start your, your business and register, and you realize nothing comes out of it. It's because they do not know how to deal with you. So you started too early dealing with the governments. But that is the point where you should start, because once you commit, you put in the energy, the efforts, you start paying your taxes. That's where the government says, and like, you're a foreign entrepreneur. I want to tour you around as my trophy because I've attracted you to my realm. That is very, very important for any foreign entrepreneur to understand. And the better you are at that, the better you will thrive. Um, and from that day on, you need to work on your Guanxi. Why governments in that regard are important, I cover that in the next slides. This is a very simple path, a lot of different ways how you can get through but do not start with governments and do not start without doing your homework. Sounds obvious, but 90, I would say 95% of the startups and SMEs that I talk to do not follow this. They just say like, okay, I pay a consultant or I start with a government. It's wrong. Like this, if you want to be successful, do that. Anything you want to add, Avalo, here? No, I think you're explaining very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, probably the government uh, thing, maybe I can even help you that you get to your 100k grant that you didn't get yet. Um, uh, yeah, so I think this one, uh, we've already, uh, do you know any mistakes of foreign entrepreneurs? You mentioned some of them talk to you um, that you've seen them doing, um, that you warned the audience about? Uh, I think I think the the main challenges that I see of um, foreigner entrepreneurs doing are not challenges because they are foreigners or because they're in China. It's just because it's product and the market or the problem that they are solving is not the right problem. Yeah. Or I, I think usually it's a business problem. It's not a country, nationality or grant or government. So that, that's that's the, the biggest challenge that I see in but from Chinese entrepreneurs, from foreign entrepreneurs, from both both sides. And also uh, you mentioned also something about the government. There are also sometimes organizations, the client is the government. Uh, that that also is is very um, challenging for foreigners, but also for Chinese, for, for both sides, no? But I guess yeah. also back in Spain or in Germany, have a to have a government as a client, sometimes there are some conditions, no? The, the payment, the, the time that they need to pay and everything. So yeah, it's more business problems what I see, not, not other specific. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, I can also share some stories about uh, common mistakes later, if you're interested in that. Um, I've run, I know, 
like 60, 70 startups already that try to enter. And I can share you some common mistakes that usually come out if you're interested in that. So incentives, uh, this one will dive now into governments. And why am I talking about governments? This one is a picture of me being uh, the first uh, first uh, foreign employee at a state-owned enterprise uh, in a way. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about China. And I can say that I understand the world in a different way now because I've been part of this organization for four years, helping the, the local state-owned enterprise to become a landing platform for international entrepreneurs. Uh, the little pink uh, is me. Um, there is one other foreigner, Kaha, but he left to Shanghai to join China Accelerator as well. I also left the company in June, so I'm not part of this anymore. But there is a lot of um, fun uh, that you can have, even with a state of enterprise, even though it sometimes doesn't sound as cool. But um, a, a lot of good people there, all of them uh, want to want to uh, uh, to uh, you to succeed in China. And I'm going to share you a couple of insights that, that I learned over the last couple of four years. Just, just one, one story. I remember it was a government related uh, co working space, also, that they offered me like uh, an office. But in exchange, they wanted equity of the company. And, and I remember uh, uh, they were telling me, oh, uh, this is normal that you are a foreigner, you don't understand. Blah, blah blah this stuff um i remember that that time the co-working space have already introduced me a lawyer a law firm and it's a big one actually it's a big one but they also do these kind of free projects once in a while and then i, I asked them oh take me as a project please and they told me i went to their office in the cbd of beijing high building and i think it was this lawyer chinese lawyer huh? chinese lawyer but these lawyers their english was very good actually and they were telling me, Alvaro, don't sign this contract. And I said, why not? It's only 4% of my company and I get free, free office and the resources. And they were telling me, no, because this is blah, blah, blah. Alvaro, I, 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 I handle many contracts like this one coming to my table. This is the worst one. You cannot accept this. So at the end, uh, luckily, thanks to the lawyer, they, at the end, I refused. Of course, the state owned was saying, Oh, you don't understand, you're a foreigner, but I was saying, but it's not me now anymore. It's a Chinese lawyer telling me to don't sign this with you. So at the end, I didn't, I didn't sign it. So it was very good at that time to have this law firm, to take the contract, to read it through. And I think for every clause, they give me a comment. And they were all against all the clauses. It was very interesting to see how, how they disagreed. They said, uh, yeah, that, that I shouldn't sign this with that specific state-owned uh, co-working space. So. Yeah. That goes in the direction of do your basic homework, uh, get lawyers involved, um, get your IP register, check your contracts, uh, check do due diligence on your partners. Uh, you would do that in the US. You should do that in China too. So if if the lawyers tell you this is not good, don't don't follow with that, right? But a lot of people they say like, oh no, China is no worries land. Uh, even if I sign this contract or not sign this contract, I'm not secured. Uh, always surprised about this statement but you can actually enforce a lot and you can make good use of lawyers. And also the EOSME Center has a free legal hotline, by the way, for all of you are uh, uh, European entrepreneurs or SMEs, uh, you can call them and they give you first advice. Of course, not too deep, then they refer it to others, but it's a good first start. Um, yeah, I already covered this one. Uh, this is still what a lot of people think, how it goes. Um, it's still the case in some industries uh, but that's not how you do business in China. Um, also not leveraging the, the, the network of the government. Uh, that was 20 years ago. However, if you, let's say now in the semiconductor industry, wind power or something like this, and you need to go to a fourth, fifth year city, this is still what you will see. So they will still ask you to drink Baidyo, but um, in first year cities, it's not the case anymore. Um, very uncommon that you're invited and you need to drink, drink, drink. Um, but giving face and having a, a personal touch to business is very important. If they want to enter a partnership with you, a JV, invest in you or so and so on, you need to have dinner with them. You need to understand them. You should bring your wife. Uh, that's a good thing to do. Um, but the standard of drinking Baijiu, uh, which is schnapps, uh, 40%, I don't like the taste. A lot of people do. I do not know why. A bottle is like $1,000 or more, um, in case you do not know that. Uh, it's it's not common standard anymore. If you enter something like this and you're in high tech, 
uh, you're probably meeting the wrong people. Uh, just saying that on the side. Um, so why, why is the government so important? Uh, it's the invisible hand. Nothing in China, uh, no business decision, no society decision is done without having the government guiding it. And you should better understand that and better be part of it than trying to work against that. Uh, because everybody around you will understand how to work with that and how to give in or move in this regard. All of them are agile enough that they can uh, rotate. Unless you're like in education industry and you went IPO in the last couple of months and you did something against the government, then they come in and they, they kill you. But this is very unlikely to most people to happen. Um, what I want to say is better be close to the government. And um, I have one slide that explains exactly the benefits of this. Uh, there are 102 companies that are directly owned by the party state. That is massive. And if you're looking at any industry that you can potentially operate has state-owned enterprises. In most countries that you are from, you do not have this kind of depth anymore. Sometimes you do not even know that you're acting with a state-owned enterprise. And all of them have as the client, the government. So they're not serving really the 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 clients at the end, uh, they are serving the government in that regard. Should be aware of that. Also, they are very important if you want to have partnerships or clients and so on and so on that you understand how to deal with these companies. Um, here are just some examples. Uh, most important one is SASAC, um, State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission of the State Council. Uh, that's, I would say, similar to Apple in that regard. Most of the Top, top, top Chinese uh, companies belong to SASAC. Uh, here are some examples, Sinopec, China no, uh, Mobile, NOCC, uh, State Grid. Um, if you want to do any business in B2B, you need to be aware of what that means. There are like 40 million people that work for this conglomerate, 40 million. That is different than, than a Volkswagen or a Siemens or uh, uh, other companies, that is massive. 10 million of them are communist party. And this is the invisible hand. You will see and feel that everywhere. You get a notion about what is going well, what's not going well. And you should understand that if you wanna do good business. And here are the top three reasons why I think you should understand that both as a startup, as well as a, as a larger company or an SME. Resources, the government provides they are the ones that give you most of the resources. And if not directly, then indirectly. Um, all the incubators and accelerators get resources through the government. Reputation. If you work with a top tier government um, or any, any government, national government or so on and so on, you get reputation and can use that. I have a picture, for example, where I'm standing on the stage with the mayor of Beijing. Since then, I have faced any government in China. I can just go. I was on stage with the mayor of Beijing, so I can go wherever I want. And you can do the same. If you're a foreign entrepreneur or SME, uh, you can go on the stage and you get reputation and you can carry that as a trophy. And the last one is security. Because very often you're not aware of where are certain risk factors. And China is not an industry uh, or a country where they are punishing, they are, they are advising you in a friendly way to change things. They, they are seldomly punish. If, if you're punished in a way you've done something for uh, very odd or very wrong, um, but usually they tell you in a certain way to shift your direction. If you're surrounded by a network that understands the government very, very well, you will understand when there are initiatives that change your industry that you should be aware of so you can prepare. If you do not have that and you push by yourself, you do not have the security. So you should learn that. If you're really serious about China, you need to get that right. So here are some resources that you can tap into. Uh, visa, R&D grants, uh, talent, um, HUCO. If you want to hire Chinese, local Chinese, you need to be aware of the HUCO system because let's say you're in Beijing and you hire someone from Chengdu and you bring them to Beijing and they have kids. The kids cannot go to, uh, to school here in Beijing. Um, so if you have a HUCO, which is like a, something like a uh, uh, residence permit, um, the kids can then go in Beijing to school which is worth around one to 2 million RMB. Um, that's a lot of money. And sometimes you get that through the governments. Uh, you get grants, you get free housing. 
So if I would go to Hangzhou and open up my company there, I get free housing. Um, that's like one and a half thousand US dollar per month. Uh, you get investment, tax incentives, and free office. Uh, that's now a general. Uh, sometimes in Beijing, it's less. In Hangzhou, it's more. Um, but these are the resources that you're looking at. Again, this one, I showed it before. So this is how the incentives are usually propagated uh, towards the market. The state, the national government, usually talks to the army of state-owned enterprises because the people doing the work are state-owned enterprises. The, um, the general man managers interpret that and put that into the divisions of their, of their departments of the company. So you have the corporate innovation department, the incubation department, the investment department. Each of them has a VP for this business line. And the general manager interprets what they are supposed to do. And what you usually do as the SME or a startup, you talk to one of the midterm or mid-level managers who is at one department has one KPI to fulfill, and they do not understand the full picture. And that is one thing that you should be aware of uh, because very often you're frustrated because you feel like you're talking against the wall. People are just saying like, I can only give you this because that's what I know. You should be aware of, if you want to have the full picture, you need to move up the value chain and talk to the general manager or someone above the VP who helps you to understand who else has the resources that you need. And the reason why, for example, Alvaro didn't get probably some of the government things is because he talked to the incubation department at, um, at, at one of the state-owned enterprises, not to the uh, government department. And the government department doesn't know how to serve the startups. So then he needs to talk both to the government, the incubation, and the service department. And once you get all of that right, you get what you need. So if you feel you're stuck, you're frustrated, uh, that's usually based on that. And in between these departments, there's no cross-communication happening. It's an entire top-down approach. Be aware of that. Um, also, one important factor is uh, very often the KPI is you as a startup to land in their, in their city. But they only see you as a KPI. So if Ivo goes to Beijing, I say, check mark, done. Um, but they only communicate that to the upper level and they do not care about the service to you. So they do not care about helping you out, giving you more uh, support. They only, they've done their job. The government will be happy about what, they, what they've done and then they let you be. And that's very tough, very frustrating. And what's happening usually is they have in between these private organizations and they take the KPIs of the government or state-owned enterprises and they serve. They know how to talk to the entrepreneurs and help you out. Um, so very often you should not directly talk to the, uh, the state-owned enterprises or governments, you will talk to the private sectors. Here are some um, for different regions, Pegasus Tech Ventures is for Chengdu, Brink is for Guangzhou, uh, Plug and Play is all over the place, uh, TechCode is also, also all over the place. Xnode is one of the best ones in Shanghai. Uh, Nihub is in Hangzhou. The Lab is one of the Beijing ones. Um, those are the people that really care about you and go deeper and support you and give you the answers, uh, usually. Right? Uh, there are more, of course. Um, yeah, Ivo, you want to add anything to the part that I mentioned so far? You just need to drink for a second. Um, yeah, I didn't deal too much with this uh, government stuff yeah i'm not good at that neither yeah okay. so, yeah, yeah we, <laughs> yeah. we will figure that out uh we will get you the grant i actually get into grant examples in a bit um but i try to to move through that quicker that we also come to our cut of the case um okay. let me uh, quicken that up so uh by the way one thing that a lot of uh people do wrong if they want to tap into incentives or grants is they put their ceo on top uh, but sometimes the CEO doesn't have the best profile. And there you have to look at, and I've already mentioned that, the one with a PhD, put them first. Um, if you have uh, uh, an MA or whatever from a global top 50 university, put them first. If you have someone with most patents, put them first. Um, in my startup, for example, my CTO has a way better profile than I have. So I'm not even mentioned in that regard. It's like, Here's the CTO, he's from Tsinghua University, blah, 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 blah. So get the ego out of the way. If you want to get into grants or something, be pragmatic and put a person on there. And the governments usually also adjust you and say like, you should put this person there because you will get more face, more grants, more access to stuff, right? Be pragmatic in that regard. 
China is very pragmatic. Um, they will classify you as people. They will look at what's your salary, what's your education, what's your background, and so on and so on. I'm a B, uh, class B. I think Alvaro was too, uh, a class B. It's very hard to get a class A um, unless you have a very high level of, of salary and very high um, uh, Chinese proficiency. Alvaro's Chinese is definitely better than mine. Um, this is something that also gives you access to different levels of grants. Uh, they will assess you and your team on how uh, how good you are. So some of the uh, common mistakes that I see is even after saying all of this is they they do not tend to trust the governments and that's a mistake. Uh, you need to have this friend, a uh, good accelerator and incubator, and you need to have trust in the local government in China. So if it's a state owned or, or uh, so I do not mean uh, trust everything they say and just assign everything blindly because there are still mistakes that can happen. But you need to have trust in the government and work with them together. Working against them can work for a while, but you will not thrive um, just in, in general. Um, one mistake that I also see is people uh, attend uh, and say, I want this grant. I saw that in Hangzhou, but there are certain things that you need to do. And how you get to a 3 million grant is you start small. You get something little like a 10K um, tax incentive or something. Then after a year, you get a 100K tax incentive. Then after three years or something, you get 3 million. You never get money upfront in that regard. You have to fulfill certain conditions. You have to have certain revenue. You have to spend time somewhere. Um, and that's one of the common mistakes ST, uh, with startups, but also with um, SMEs. Um, give me cash now goes in the same direction, you need to be patient about it. Uh, so if you win a demo day, you probably need to wait a year or something. You need to commit, you need to register your company wherever this competition was, and then you get the cash maybe after a year. Not Nothing up front. Sometimes they say 50% uh, cash up front, but that's seldom. Um, you can do it yourself, goes also in the same direction. You can do it. But if you have the vision of owning China in your product niche, um, you should not do it because you will, uh, if people see there is an opportunity and the market is big enough, they will just come in and they will have government support. And you should, you should understand that. So here are some examples. Um, how much time do we have? Because otherwise I will uh, skip through the examples or go very quickly through that. Short. Uh, Yelte, we have around 30 minutes uh, and then we will go for the Q&A. Oh, okay. Okay, then I still have some time. Okay. Um, okay, so here are some of the things. Uh, this is based on Beijing, by the way, uh, where you get uh, tax reduction. So you can reduce your tax from uh, uh, about uh, from 40 to 25%. Uh, usually, if you're in high tech and you have the uh, technology in your, in your company name you, and you're in the right tax zone, you get a lot of tax incentives. Um, all of these have preconditions, um, but usually you do not do your accounting yourself anyway. So if you're working with an accountant firm or something, they will tell you about this um, because the more money you save, uh, the more happier you will be with the accountant firm anyway, right? So this is a basic thing. R&D expense support, I think I mentioned that before, uh, one of the most underestimated ways to enter China is R&D. You got a lot of support um, in terms of R&D. And what you can do is you learn about the Chinese market and you can produce for the world. You can learn for the world. And China is about China speed. And all of us come from Europe or European-based uh, companies. And uh, one thing that we are not good at is speed. China speed is different. Like if you bring your top tier product here, you wait six months, there is a competition who has the same quality or higher. This is China speed. They do not wait. They have this 996 uh, working culture. They all have goals and ambitions. They have a lot of money to burn. They can easily get into anything uh, that, that you already have. Uh, so that's why I think RD is a good thing because you can learn without being at risk that, you, that your top products will be uh, copied. And you can bring this China speed and China knowledge back to your home country and, and uh, US or Europe. And uh, here is one thing where you can get around 200,000 on top or a million on top, depending on how much you spend yourself on R&D. And expenditure in R&D is usually uh, 
if you hire an AI engineer or in, ge in general, you, you, you spent on uh, certain patents, shift part of that to China and you get a lot of resources. If you're in certain smart material or national government incentives, uh, you even get like way more than this and that you get the space for free, the laboratories for free, sometimes stuff for free. There's a lot of money that you can tap into. <clears throat> Um, investment upgrade, I think this is one that I mentioned to Alvaro and he failed to get. Um, I actually, maybe we can talk about this in a bit. Uh, what you need to do is you need to get 3 million of investment, 3 million RMB in China uh, that must come from a Chinese VC firm, a registered VC firm. If, you, if it's not a Chinese registered uh, VC firm, you will not get access to that. And what you get on top, the, the government in Beijing here, for example, they mirror this and say like here's 100,000 for free plus you will get into this exclusive club of successfully founded startups and then you're like again handed around like a trophy it's very important to know maybe here we can make a short break and go to Alvaro why didn't it work for you this case you also you applied for mm, I don't know <laughs> you tell me why it didn't work out <laughs> yeah, but you, you got the investment um, of 3.5 million for, for your startup, right? Yeah. Yeah. But and, from a private private VC, not, not from uh, the government. Yeah, yeah that, that will be probably the reason. So if, if an angel investor comes in and invests in you, um, that is not an official government registered VC. Um, so only from them, if you get that, you get free money from the government. That's probably the reason why you didn't get this one. Oh, okay. They need to have a certain license for that. Uh, so this is where uh, a lot of people actually come to me and say like, hey, but I raised 5 million. But um, if it's from a private investor or something like this, uh, then you are not entitled to get these grants. So um, by the way, a lot of these uh, service providers, they also take a kind of a uh, financial advisor role and they say you are qualified to get this or that grant. And they take five to 10% of the end sum uh, that they can get out. So um, for example, one of the service providers I work with, they also do that. You can tell them, I want to get into this grant, try to do it. And if you do it, uh, then you get 10% of that. So they would get 10,000 RMB out of this if they would um, uh, get you into this, which is still a good and nice deal. Um, talent is actually one of the things that the government is pushing for very, very much. Um, so if you have, uh, for example, if you have a PhD, uh, they want you and they will pay a lot of money for that. Uh, they will give you free apartments. They will give you a lot of uh, landing support and so on and so on. So if you're an SME or a startup and you have someone with a PhD and they might consider going to China, um, do that. And this person will get a lot of support. Your company will get a lot of support. Um, if, you're a if you are yourself or you have someone in your team who is a returnee Chinese, um, you can, uh, uh, this is also part of the national strategy to kind of bring back the, the sec second generation Chinese to, uh, to the homeland um, because they want to have all the knowledge transfer, right? And that's where they also pay a lot of money to get them over. So if you have part of your team members being second generation Chinese or so on, send them over and you get a lot of support. And this is up to 1 million RMB per person. Um, so a lot of money. This is around 150,000 uh, euros uh, that, you, that you can get per person and incentives. Um, so I did not go actually into uh, raising money uh, because I think you are the expert on that. You've successfully done that, a lot of money. Um, can you share, Alvaro, what do you think are the do's and don'ts when rise, raising money here in China as a foreign entrepreneur? Um, so, uh, well, I, I, I don't have a slide, but I'm going to tell them my story, baby. Um, so as you guys, uh, I mean the audience, as you heard, so I, I won that competition and then I, I started my business having revenue and then I went to a co-working space incubator um, the first things that happened to me as an entrepreneur is that at the beginning I was, because I was working before in the corporate world, no companies like Microsoft, so I had my savings. But I remember when I brought my co-founder, he was a student. So 
he told me, yeah, I remember he was hungry, he, like he had to eat, so he needed some money. So at that moment, I, we realized, okay, now the revenue doesn't cover completely the cost, so we need some investment. And at, at that time, we checked with the uh, incubators. So the incubator where I was, uh, they organized many events, uh, many competitions. Uh, but I realized that talking with investors, actually, you spend a lot of time and energy. In my case, also, I had to, to talk in Chinese. So it's very time consuming. And I felt that we were not ready to fundraise from a venture capital. So I asked if there is any possibility for a private investment. Maybe private investment is better. So um, I remember the uh, first at that time, uh, it was like our intern gave us some money, <laughs> 50,000 euros, 15,000 euros. Then another startup founder gave us 15,000 euros. And there is also, and the university, since I was doing many tests in some lectures, uh, a professor also gave me around 20,000 euros. And then uh, the incubator also, because it's famous, the incubator, there are, they, there are some professional angel investors, like people as of maybe as a hobby, they invest, but in many startups. So they go to the incubator to check with the incubator. Is there any startup recently, something interesting? And I remember that um, they, uh, the, the, there is one American private investor the American private investor, uh, he was looking for a startup that has a founder that can speak English fluently. So they introduced us. And I think it was good because after a couple of meetings, he also gave us like 20,000 euros. So at the end, it was like 100,000 US dollars that we closed for our, our, our first round. And it was through convertible notes. So basically I didn't give equity because I didn't have very clear how much was the valuation of the company at the moment. So the convertible note basically means that uh, we sign a contract, I received the money. And then in the moment that I fundraise from an investment fund, a venture capital, these guys are gonna force me to evaluate the company because these guys are gonna immediately ask for equity. So in that moment that I have a valuation, I can give back to my private investors equity but also with, uh, with, how to say, with a compensation, like 20% more that they deserve because they invested in a very early stage. So that's a convertible note, it's called SAFE from Y Combinator, and I use that. So that was the, the first, that was the first uh, uh, round of investment uh, from private investors. Then uh, end of the year, uh, we start to fundraise because we were getting more revenue. So, and I start to participate to competitions and then the venture capital firms are with, I'm, I think I met like 30, 30 of them, but only five actually, I get to the managing partner, the one that makes the decision to bring it to the board to decide if they invest or not. And out of these five, I got uh, two, uh, two term sheets. It means two venture capital firms, they give me the contract. Hey Alvaro, these are the conditions. If you like it, we can give you now the detailed contract. Out of these two, I just I choose choose one. Um, I don't know. There are many anecdotes in the in this fundraising journey. Do you guys want to more details, or you think that's enough? Because I, I I'm not sure if someone is fundraising or not. Um, I'm actually interested in, or maybe you can share it, how important it was for you to speak Chinese. Um, so can anybody just go and pitch as a foreigner, or how important do you think it is to to speak Chinese in that regard? Oh, uh, I think it was important. All my pitch were always in, 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 Ch in Chinese. Yeah, always. And of course, as, as a foreigner, pitching is, is hard because they always use the card of, oh, you're a foreigner, you're not serious, you're just playing around. And that, that's always, always hard a little bit. But, uh, but the, the investors are hard with you as they are hard with the Chinese entrepreneurs as well. So um, is, I think I remember that. Uh, I had in some competitions that there were like 15 Chinese startups and myself, and I had to do it in Chinese. And I received the criticism like, hey, you're a foreigner. So if I give you the money, you may leave the country. So sometimes there are these things that they are not sure. And I remember I didn't like it always to receive that, that feedback. But um, I remember that even we were 15 startups, and at the end, I was the only one that when I was leaving the competition upset because I didn't 
like they thought that I was playing around because I'm a foreigner. Like I took it as like nothing serious. I, I, I was not happy, but I remember the secretary of the, the, the managing partner just found me outside. I was leaving the room. They say, hey, Alvaro, uh, tomorrow when you come to the office at, at 4 p.m. I was thinking, okay, I was still upset. But then I went to the, the typical high building that, that is just another world, no? high building, people wearing a suit, investors. So, and then I, I remember that I also mm -hmm. told them, hey, why you get this guy talk to me in that way, thinking that I'm playing around and now he wants to meet me. And he said, and remember they said, oh, because he likes you, Alvaro. But look, they remind me, look what the, he said to the other startups. They were all Chinese. I think that for me it was attacking me because maybe I was a foreigner, but for the other ones they were attacking because they didn't have money. It's like, hey, you are fundraising, but you cannot generate revenue to maintain yourself. So you cannot even to prove me that you have a, a, a sustainable business model. So in my case, I had a sustainable business model. So at the end, that's what he preferred my project rather than the other projects. I think that's the most important thing. No? If you can prove yourself and to everyone that you have a sustainable business model, then that every, anyone is attracted to that, even they are from another nationality, because that's the investor. And, uh, and I remember at the end, it didn't work out well with this investor because I think we were from different backgrounds. Yes, by the way of communicating all of the meetings, uh, because we know what you receive the contract, then you go through the lawyer, then you have every clause, you have a, 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 hey, change this, change this, change this. I realized there were too many things to change and they didn't want to change neither, right? So it becomes like a three hours discussion in Chinese <laughs> about this, this clause, please change that, like this, like that. So at the end, uh, they didn't want to work with me. I also was not interested in them anymore. Uh, but at the same time, I, 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 was, I had a meeting in the co-working space, one investor, and they said, hey, Alvaro, we, you are in the multilingual translation, and we are also, it's like an investment fund that have an LP, a limited partner that is a voice recognition company in China. So they give them millions to this fund to invest in the startups that are using voice recognition. No, it's kind of a strategic partnership. Uh, and then they, they were interested. I had to fly to Shanghai to meet the managing partner. And surprisingly, I really liked the guy. I think it, after meeting so many investors, he gave me good feeling. Of course, he didn't speak English, everything in Chinese, but he had done his own startup before. I could see that. I could see all the investors, even you need to send them your pitch. You need to send them materials. When you arrive, they always say, Okay, pitch to me. But this guy was different. When I went to his office, which was smaller, maybe comparing with other big funds that I had, I had met, um, is the only one that said, you don't need to pitch to me, Alvaro. I already did my homework. I know all your startup. I know your business. I have seen your pitch before. So let's talk in more detail. Uh, I don't know, someone that I felt, I felt respected. <laughs> and you appreciate that when you're fundraising. And I also like a lot because of course, I went with my contract with some translation because sometimes some part of the contract I don't understand. And I remember he told me, Alvaro, you are like me. He said, a few years ago, I sold my company in B round to an American fund and I was using Baidu Translate. Translate, what are you using? I said, Google Translate. So he had gone through the same I was going through. So I felt this guy not only respect me, he understand me, it's not easy. Of course, I'm defensive, no? Uh, you are, you're gonna receive money from you, several millions. And I'm going to give you equity of my company. So I just want to make sure I don't give you my soul. Um, so, yeah. So then he also is, is, is an investor that also educate me how this works. No? Like, hey, Alvaro, there are 52 terms. You cannot fight for the 52 of them. Pick the three that hurt you the most, the ones you hate the most. And these three, let's find a common ground. And um, yeah, it was good. So at the end, we signed the contract and we, we received the 3.6 million, like, like half, half million US dollars. Yeah, and that was my, now, of course, uh, it was not easy. It sounds like in a minute that it seems easy to fundraise. Uh, meeting 30 investment funds is not easy for two things. Physically, you have to go to meet them. It's tiring. And also psychologically, because they're going to attack you from wherever they can. <laughs> no, it's like, it's your baby. You build your own company and they're going to tell you, uh, other one can do this better, can do this faster. Why you? Why like that? Like that? You don't. In my case, you don't understand the market. You are a foreigner. I tell you, hey, I'm living here ten years, but, but still, you don't have the roots like others have. So you see, every excuse at the beginning. I, I'm human. I get pissed off sometimes. I talk very bad, but you you start to learn. 
how to control yourself and at the end you realize that part of this is part of the process so then when you start meeting already 15 firms or 16 the 17th you just not react the same no you just smile you eat all the feedback and then politely you start to answer back why is in this way or for example i even found a good argument why to say it's better to invest me as a foreigner than if i were a chinese why is better of course you have to prepare no it's a debate so i have an answer for that also so yeah and i remember how to find investors it was the old way i realized there is an event in beijing and one of the speakers is uh it was gen fun the one that invested in ofo this uh, this sharing bike business uh, and uh, it's, it's a big firm here in China. I just went there, the event finished, then you just wait. The guy goes to the elevator to go back home. You wait in the elevator. I remember it was a colleague of mine also was waiting there and then we intercept the guy. Or I remember there was another competition and I know one of the investors was Sequoia. Then we, we just go there. And in the moment that there is a break, we intercept the guy and we just in one minute, we do the pitch. Hey, we're making revenue. We are almost break even. My clients are Harvard, Audi, McKinsey. Uh, can you consider to have a meeting? And then the guy said, oh, yes. Of course, he was shocked. Like suddenly we were surrounding him. We don't allow him to leave. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the, 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 the way we, we try to find investors. So yeah, I hope, I, I don't know if this can help <laughs> or somebody can learn something from this story. But, yeah. I think it's and very impressive. Um, I will, you mentioned 16 uh, investment firms, right? More, 30, 30. 30. 30. Even, yeah. even 30 is very impressive to get to that uh, closure because usually if you want to get to this kind of deal that early stage, you need to get to around uh, 80, 90, 100 pitches. Um, so really getting to the closure, you have been very efficient in that regard. Um, just something personal. Uh, that probably the audience doesn't know, but I, I would like to ask your opinion on that, how much it played a role. Uh, you're married to a Chinese. Um, how could the investor still say that you're not, that, uh, that you're not committed to the market? And, and how much did this help you or support you to get forward in, in the fundraising process? Uh, I think it's just part of the process. They need to challenge me, right? Yeah. For example, they cannot say you have no clients because I have Harvard, Audi, blah, blah, blah. They cannot say you have no revenue then because I have revenue. So they, they had to say something. But if, for example, if I were Chinese, they, they would have said like the other Chinese, the poor Chinese startups, also the super motivated pitching. But I remember the investor telling them, oh, very good, very beautiful. But have you get even one renminbi revenue? And the guy quiet because he haven't got any client yet. So yeah, they just was finding something to, to, to attack. But, one thing that I learned, that's why now it's taking me more time to fundraise for the next round, is if you go with numbers, then the other things are just blah, blah, blah. No matter if I am blue or green, what color, if I am from the Earth or Mars, if I go with something that is growing exponentially, I can tell you, the investor, he has to be interested, cannot miss that opportunity. It's part of his job to find yeah. this type of startups. So, so yeah, at the end, it hurts when they say this. Uh, but then you realize well, that's his job. He needs to challenge me from, from somewhere. Then you change your mentality. Then it becomes better. If not, I met other entrepreneurs, super in a bad mood. <laughs> so you have to adapt to this. That's how we yeah, do it. Yeah. yeah, thank you for, for sharing this, Alvaro. Um, I just want to give some perspective on, uh, on the other way of fundraising, actually, which probably most startups are, um, are facing, is when you sit in Europe and you want to get investment in China. Uh, so what I can share from my experience working with so many foreign uh, scale startups that want to enter here is uh, that they do not get any VC funding from China if you did not do your homework and if you did not enter in any way here. The only way how you can receive upfront money is if the VC fund is active in your home country and you can, uh, like Gen Fund, they are also in other parts of the world, they can invest in you in Europe um, beforehand, and then they can bring you to China. But it's very to not likely uh, that you will get investment just because you have the numbers ready in Germany. And in that regard, I wanna re remind the people about the slide that I showed before. If you enter China, you start from zero. And also investors will assess you from zero. 
You have no clients, you have no network, you have no knowledge. Why should anybody give you money? So if you want to get to money in China um, right away, I think the best thing that you can do is look for the VC arms that are both active in your home country and in China. And then you can make a bridge that they help you to come to China. That's the strong muscle that your later stage investors should have or enter through accelerators. Uh, there are some that are focused on this, bringing international startups in here. Uh, one uh, to drop a name is China Accelerator, uh, backed by SOSV. Um, Brink is also a landing pad for that. Uh, Nihab does that. Um, those are specialized in uh, seed investing into your Chinese entity. So you usually get a, a, around 100 to 150,000 US dollar for a certain percentage of your company. The equity is around seven to 10% of your equity. And those will help you to localize. Those will help you to localize your pitch and introduce them to the investors that actually are keen to invest in foreign startups that want to enter the Chinese market. I do not know many other ways how to do that. Um, what you can do um, and what works often in, in Germany or in Europe is if you have a distributor uh, strategy, uh, you can enter China without having uh, a local entity here, but you need to have the numbers ready. So you need to showcase you already have, let's say, 10,000 clients in this B2C product. Uh, if you get like another $1 million of investment, you can push that to 100,000 products or something like this. That works, but only in the distribution uh, uh, work. If you want to enter with B2B or B2C directly or an R&D, you need to do your homework first. Nobody will give you, <coughs> give you money up front. And you heard uh, from Avril how hard even he had it, even though he's married to a Chinese, speaks Chinese, is in the market, has revenue, has everything. You're challenged every, every day. So that's, that's very tough to do. Um, there's one question in the q and I want to dive into that a bit later because it's IP related. But um, Avril, let's dive a bit more into, into your case. Can you share some of the downs that you had? Um, may it be um, mistakes you made, uh, hiring, accounting, finance, uh, selling, approaching partners, working with governments, anything that you think is worth um, uh, sharing, uh, obstacles that you faced on your way? Um, I think that um, there are so many uh, um, incentives or things for entrepreneurs, uh, or also for foreigners, that at the beginning I was spending too much, too much time into that. Maybe that's one thing. Um, at the end, now I'm not focused on that. I'm just trying to get money through my business. Um, then about the team, yeah, my team, well, if there are challenges, I guess it's maybe my lack of leadership, <laughs> what you need, need to improve, but I don't think it's because of the uh, nationality. My team is very, very international. So from different countries, I have people in Spain, I have people in China, in Pakistan, in China, in Shanghai, in Beijing, also in Korea. So yeah, I think building a team, uh, that's not a problem. Of course, there are so many firings as well. Uh, but again, I don't think people that get fired is, get fired because of the nationality, just get fired because um, doesn't belong to the culture. No, maybe. Also because of the skills. That is another, another reason. So, so yeah, it's not not been a big challenge about hiring. is not haven't been a, a challenge actually. Um, yeah, if we have a big challenge now in the company, maybe it's about the, the market because now we started in the Chinese market, but we realized it's much bigger the international market, actually. Uh, so now we're getting many clients in Europe and in in the US that people that need live translation for virtual events or virtual. Uh, 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 events and also offline, but also with platforms itself. We are integrating, we have uh, integration for platforms also in live e-commerce as well. They integrate us. So now when somebody's selling a product, they can talk in one language, but they can have subtitles in Bahasa for the Indonesian market or in other languages. So, and we use human interpreters or AI. So, but that we discover actually thanks to going international. Because one thing that we notice in the market of translation is that uh, Chinese market, we are getting revenue from there, but it's a very potential market that works inside, inside. No, the Chinese companies have to get Chinese customers because it's, it's so huge, the market. And sometimes that's why they are not interested to do streaming in different languages. But when we, we go overseas, 
and we get an American company selling glasses and they're doing live shopping, live e-commerce, their market is not only the US, it is also Israel, Germany, Algeria, Thailand, Vietnam. They want to sell to everyone in the world. So then we realize, hey, there is more potential for us in the inter international market rather than in the Chinese market. And also this is aligned with our investors as well, because uh, they, we all want that if for the next round, we can get actually US dollars funding, not Chinese renminbi. So if not, we get a stick into the, only the Chinese market. So yeah, the challenges that we have is more uh, business oriented, not related. So I don't know if the audience is interested to see or to listen our challenges for the business, but yeah, that's what our situation right now. Yeah, I mean, um, also to share from, from my business in Founders Lair, we are also building a marketplace uh, that connects kind of um, uh, corporate innovators with startups. And we also realized the same that Ivor mentioned, that China works within. It's uh, the rest of the world is working cross border and they want to do things together. And China, most of the business is within. So you need to have a separate solution if you build a platform either for uh, translation or for uh, matchmaking or marketplaces. You need to develop, de develop something for the local market. Also your tech stack will probably separate at one point if you want to tap into both markets. And that's one question probably for the future of all. Do you, do you um, plan to stick around then here in China and build something for the Chinese market? Um, or do you plan to focus everything on um, cross-border getting the US fund in and then spending your time on the rest of the world? Now since more priority, so we are getting revenue from China. So we have many clients here, but the it's, it's growing what we get up from international market. And I think soon we'll overpass the 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 Chinese revenue that we're getting yeah mm. okay but will you do both from a technical perspective uh, yeah, yes because because it's not it's not difficult for us because we have the infrastructure of our solutions servers and everything uh, mm. so it's not difficult to to keep our services here at all since we since we are here it's just about the new markets that are growing are growing in overseas at least for us Asia Pacific mm. as well is a uh, Asia Pacific there are many different languages there, no? Thailand, uh, May from Malaysia and Bahasa, and all of them try to get markets in live e-commerce for them, also in congresses, to get into get audience there. So these are potential markets that of course I'm willing to explore. And, and it's easy for us actually, since we're already present in Asia, we realize it's very easy actually to get to, to open those markets. So yeah, mm. we're going into those directions. Okay. Um, now I try to shift a bit more to the question that's uh, there. Did you um, uh, develop any IP strategy, any IP that you registered? Was it a thing for you or not? Yes. So, so IP inside China. So in, inside China, we have first uh, IP for our, uh, for our logo or name. This is one thing. The other thing is for the concept that we are doing. No, in the, that's one of the things that the lawyer suggests us. So in our case, we're doing this remote translation for human interpreters or for AI machine to, to provide this captioning or voice translated for these events, platforms, and Congress. So that concept we apply for an, for an IP, intellectual property. And of course, it doesn't mean that, so it basically is a protection in case a competitor suddenly claims, hey, this concept that I built, you are copying me, so you cannot do this in this market. Then I can show in a very early stage, 2018, I already filed for that. So then nothing can happen. I can, how to say, it's, it's to avoid problems in the future. Yeah, the early stage, I filed for that and that's it. Even if it didn't pass, because sometimes it's a long process, as long as you can see that you file for this system that you have built for an IP or trademark, it's, is already good enough. So that's what we did for tennis market. And when when did you come up with that idea to do that? What was the trigger for you? Oh, that was in the in the uh, incubator, because in the incubator there is this. Uh, it was very good. It was every week there are like ten experts that comes to the incubator, and we entrepreneurs can book their time just only uh, twenty minutes or twenty five minutes. And they are not, they are from McKenzie, they are from a law firm, they are, 
I guess it was one of the law firms that you just sit and then the 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 expert start asking you about this his her field, no? Like, hey, how are you guys doing about trademark? Of course, we said we have nothing. And then the lady, hey, what about for little amount of money, two hundred euros, you can file for this trademark and this and this, maybe maximum. No, because she, they know you're a startup. They are coming to the incubator. They know we don't have budget. And then they say, if you do this, you can get protected. Of course, we also check with other startups in the incubator. Have you guys done this? And they say, yeah, we did it, we did it, we did it. Then we said, let's do it. So it was the incubator who actually, uh, the mentorship program, this one-on-one helped us a lot. Mm. And um, having your trademark uh, uh, secured and having this concept secured is a different thing. So when did it, when did it become uh, important for you to secure your concept? This uh, because you're also in in code, in software, in in AI. It's very hard actually to file an IP in that regard. But what was the point where someone came to you and said like you should do that, and you thought this is the right time to do it? Was it the same oh, time as the trademark or? No, it was also because we had a competitor doing the similar exact thing. And they also filed for that. Uh, I think the, the agency that we were using, they said, hey, is this guy your competitors? Yeah, uh, they also have filed for a system like yours. And then we saw, yeah, actually they are our, our direct competitors. So we, when we saw they were doing, then we also, we also do that. Then at least they can never say they were like 10 years before us building this system, this solution. Yeah. And um, who did tell you that your competitor was doing that? Was that your your IP consultant or? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the agency. The agency can check about the concept that you are filing for, can check in the system to see if the companies or these keywords have been actually patented or something. So yeah, they, they did that. Mm. And uh, last question, and then I will answer myself to that one, is do you think it's important that, uh, uh, so, that you do this as a startup or it doesn't matter too much? I don't think it's important at all because <laughs> in, in the last five years, I've met like hundreds of startups and I think no one failed because IP. If they fail is because of the, the business that they have. Yeah, yeah. Um, this also goes in the direction of how I would answer that. In general, IP uh, in most industries does not matter too much. Speed matters and impl implementation and growth. So how fast do you learn and how fast do you, do you improve your product to the client? Build something that you want, uh, that people want. <coughs> um, that is of course not true if you're in the area of uh, healthcare devices, uh, pharmaceuticals, biotech, um, uh, robotics, certain processes then you need to file your IP as, as early as possible. And you should also do that in China. But if you're in any regard um, in, in that field, my, my uh, advice is usually do not come with your best product to the market. Come with like second or third generation, like down the line, something older model um, and, and bring that to the market. And um, then you see how the market reacts because again, you need to build something unique for the Chinese market. Once you figure that out, then you can start filing that. Um, and in, in the rest, I also have not seen any startup failing uh, because of IP. It's usually they, they did not get enough revenue or they, they didn't build a product that really was wanted in the market. And uh, that's again, linked to uh, speed of learning and speed of, of access the uh, of building. Right, um, so IP I wouldn't say is too important. That's by the way, something that 90% of all the startups that I'm working with all do. Uh, they, they focus too much on, on these topics of like, I need to protect everything before I go to, to China, even though the, it's not really worth it. You, you have to start from scratch and build something for the Chinese market. So it, what they always want is I, I take what I have and bring it to China but you have to learn again here from you. So the IP is not so important. I hope, it, I hope that um, answered the question for, for Ivy. Um, uh, if it's specifically about IP, uh, you, can, you can also, again, uh, your SME center, uh, they have an IP, IPR help desk, uh, which you can also answer, uh, reach out to and help you with a lot of things. 
Cool. Um, Alvaro, uh, anything good? Uh, so we talked about some flaws, about hiring, about fundraising and stuff, but anything good you want to share about being an entrepreneur in China? Oh, mm. um, how to say? <laughs> anything? Yeah, like for me, it's, it's, it's not, I never see it, uh, uh, how to say, a negative thing or a challenge to be a foreigner. It's just you have the right business, you are, you are solving the right problem, you get clients. Sometimes I remember myself, no? through my website, through traffic, I get Chinese clients, institutions, government departments, they need our solution. And yeah, and maybe they, they don't even know we're foreigners. Yeah, sometimes they don't know. They just need to have a problem. They're searching for a solution. They find us and we're here and we provide a solution for them. Of course, there are, the, the challenge that I have is always from business perspectives, from operational perspective, but, but I wouldn't disencourage anyone. I wouldn't encourage anyone. The Chinese market is 1.2 billion people, right? So if you're in a B2C and, and it's just, just do it, do it. But of course, the language is, in, is, in, is, in, is important. That's the, the only thing. Also, I've met some entrepreneurs that they don't know Chinese at all. It's just they built a good team. No, with the people that know Chinese that can talk for them with them. So I think that also also is good. In my case, I'm a stubborn, so I learn Chinese myself. Um, do you think that you would have been as successful with your startup um, if you would have started in Europe? If I would have been less successful or more successful? No, if you would have been as successful as you as you are now, if you would have started in in Europe. Um, what do you think that, so I know it's a hypothetical question, but what do you think uh, provided you with the right uh, resources and learnings here in China that you would probably not have received in, in Europe? Actually, many people ask me that question, but I don't know, because I started being an entrepreneur in China. So for the last year I've been here, so I don't know the resources that I can get back in Barcelona, for example. I, I, I don't know if they would have been that many startup events like here, or the investors are so willing to, to listen to you like, like here. I, I don't know, I cannot compare. So you're a real Chinese entrepreneur. That's, that's good. Um, cool. Um, is there anything about Akadu that you want to share with the audience um, about your, your uh, case of being an entrepreneur that we have not tapped into yet? No. Uh, Alvaro, I just have a question for you, perhaps. Um, yes. You were talking before um, about how you had to defend your baby, Akadu, in front of potential investors and how you actually learned not to take it personal just to say, and to actually just uh, learn how to answer in a way that could please the person who was asking the question, even if it hurt you somehow because it was a way of attacking your baby and, and you had to defend it. And there was a question you mentioned um, that at some point you turned the answer around and you were able to even convince uh, the, pot the potential investors that uh, investing in a Chinese in a foreign uh, startup was even better than investing in a Chinese one. I am curious, which is actually the argument you used for that reasoning. Oh, actually, I yeah, that's a good one. I learned this from Sequoia. I guess you guys know Sequoia is a big investment fund firm. And in the US, uh, I read an article from one of the manager, the, the partners. He was saying that he likes investing in foreigners in the US, foreigners, because the foreigners that go to the US with a business, they have only one goal in their life, just the business. They don't bring family, they don't bring friends, they don't bring ex girlfriends, just their business. And they are so focused that who wouldn't invest on them? Then I was telling I was telling similar thing to here to the Chinese investors. It's like I I just here with one unique goal. It's just my business. And Chinese New Year, when everyone leave, go back to the hometown. I stay here for the business. So I try to just 
to show them how actually I was all in into this, all in. And yeah, it was a good answer. Of course, I polished it in better like this, but it was into that direction, how I used to used to tell them that my willingness, or oh, I'm so focused into that more than other Chinese, that maybe I just testing after they graduated. I was not, for me, that was serious. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it is actually true that at least um, in most of the cases, the foreigners are known for being hard workers in China. They're the ones that work normally overtime and they really put effort in the job. So yeah, it, it makes sense the reasoning you gave them. Thank you. Sorry, I was just writing in the chat. Um, I think we're in Q&A session. Um, maybe you can shor shortly share with the audience uh, what does ACADU stand for? Oh, <laughs> thanks for the question. So it's a story. So please, everyone focus. Um, around around 3,000 years ago, in the Middle East, there was a city called Babylon City. And the citizens were building a tower called the Babel Tower with one unique purpose to reach heaven. Now, based on the Bible, God was never happy with that idea. So punish all the citizens and makes them talk different languages so they cannot communicate, they cannot finish the tower. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are old stories, but in real life, 3000 years ago, the, the language that the people were talking in Babylon city is called Akkadian. Akkadian is a forgotten language. It doesn't exist anymore, but it existed. You can Google it. And one of the words of the Akkadian alphabet is Akadu. Akadu means something coming from Akkadian culture and language. So in honor to that forgotten language, we call ourselves Akadu. And uh, the logo, actually, we took it from the first character from the Akkadian alphabet. The letter A has some triangles. So we took it from there as well. So there is this history behind Akadu name and law. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I really love that. By the way, um, Alvaro and I, we, we know each other uh, for how many years now? I think six years. Um, and uh, I... I used to be still a business consultant and Alvaro was, was a brave enough to uh, take the step of becoming an entrepreneur. So we knew each other before either of us were entrepreneurs. And I'm super happy that, that we are still uh, friends after so many years. And he has been successful with that path. And I followed a bit later uh, and still, still in this uh, regard. I just see that there is one question in the chat. Um, uh, perhaps Which, I can help you yet. Uh, I can't yeah. for you. Uh, could you share your view on the possibilities of getting a Chinese uh, venture capital investment for foreign startups that are not registered in China? Okay. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, before, actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I answered that. Um, I can just repeat. So in very short, uh, it's very unlikely that um, that foreign entrepreneurs get uh, get Chinese VC money uh, from afar. Uh, so the answer that I had was uh, you should focus on those uh, VC firms that have also a branch in your home country and approach them there and uh, get them into your investment portfolio and enter with them the Chinese market. That is what you can do if you have the muscle. Um, uh, the other ways you can do is if you have the numbers in terms of uh, uh, sales through distribution already without having an entity, you can say, hey, with a bit, little bit of more investment, uh, I can increase that. Uh, and that's what you can do with foreign investors in, uh, in, in your home country, maybe even uh, with Chinese investors, but for that you need good numbers. So again, uh, what Alvaro mentioned in, in, uh, in the past before, uh, if, if you are uh, later round, they only look at the numbers. They do not care where you come from, what you do. If you can show that you're growing by like 5% uh, per week, uh, then they don't care. They will listen to you and see what your business case is, and then they will invest in you. And also in that regard, Chinese are very pragmatic, uh, also in later round. Yeah, just one comment for this. Um, 
if any foreign startup or European startup is looking for Chinese fund and you talk with them, you can just directly ask them if they have US dollars or euros, yep. most probably US dollar. Because if they say, I, I met some funds that they were asking me, since I was a foreigner, they were asking me, Alvaro, do you want renminbi or US dollars? And at the time I wanted uh, renminbi. So it means the guys that, the funds that are tell, asking you if you have US dollar, it means they have money outside of China ready, uh, ready to be to invest. Then it's, it's not complicated. There is one of structures that you can set up. So you have a branch in China, but the headquarters are outside of China. And then you get the money from the Chinese firm in that in that uh, branch or that office or company. So it's yeah. doable. But again, what Alvaro mentions here is commitment to the market. Uh, so you need to have a certain company structure here in order to get that. So just being uh, sitting in, in your home country and trying to receive the money to enter through distribution is very unlikely. So you will have to set up a VIE structure, a joint venture, a Wufi. Uh, a Wufi itself doesn't make any sense if you have not linked it to anything else. Um, so uh, you should have a certain holding structure uh, that you can uh, receive the money. And, and uh, But this is the minimum commitment that you should have. So without having a company registered in China is very hard. And I've actually, so if you would ask me if I know any case, uh, I do not know any uh, that work without having an entity here. The only things that work is if you have a distribution uh, B2C that works here and uh, you already sell, then the investors will come and invest into your uh, mother entity that, that works, yeah. Okay, cool. I think we reached the, the, the end of the of the time, the available time today. Um, I would like to thank you both, Yelte and Alvaro, for this wonderful cooperation. Uh, it's been a, a nice exchange of, of um, professional uh, backgrounds and, and expertise. I think uh, we gave a very nice overview of, of the market and, and the opportunities and um, well, uh, experience don't, do's and don'ts. Um, I would like to thank all the participants also that uh, were available today for this. Uh, one just reminder from our side, uh, once you close the system, you will be invited to fill up a survey that will take, take you three, four minutes top. Um, we will encourage you to fill it up because it will help us to understand uh, how you like this webinar, how you like uh, our performance, but also it will help us to define upcoming training opportunities. So uh, thank you in advance for, for filling it up. Um, I would like also to, to thank Stenda and um, the Slovene China uh, Business Forum and uh, to the participants and to the speakers. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.